Winter said, his eyes suddenly going wet. Everything you've listed, Detective Marks, is conjecture, the attorney said. His face was a mask, but his thumb tapped the side of his leather briefcase. He knew they had his client cold. Except for the verified security camera footage we have of your client murdering Dr. Norris, Lance said, unable to resist counterpunching. Except for that. The attorney opened his mouth to speak, but Winter held up a hand, silencing him. Okay, detectives, you got me dead to rights, he said, wrangling in his emotions once again. If your case is as strong as you say, then what harm is there in telling me the source of the video? It was recorded by the home security system in Brit Norris's house, Lance said. Winter shook his head. That was not my question, Sergeant. Who supplied the video file? Lent hesitated a moment, glanced at Valerie, and then said, Platform Cognition. Who at Platform Cognition? Winter said, leaning forward and putting his elbows on the table. We're not at liberty to say, Land replied. Valerie studied Winter's expression, curious to see if he recognized the unspoken truth behind Land's words, that Land didn't know who'd sent the email. Bart and the tech department hadn't cracked that nut, and their liaison at Platform Cognition claimed the same. Nobody knew who'd sent the video clip. Nobody except for her. You don't know who sent it, Winter said, and leaned back in his chair, his gaze shifting to Valerie, the color suddenly blanching from his face. You know who sent the video. Don't you, Detective Marks? Damn, he's good. She didn't answer and resisted the urge to trade glances with Land. I'd like to talk to Detective Marks alone, Winter said abruptly. Valerie's red cheeks apparently all the confirmation he needed. Absolutely not, Land snapped. You don't make the rules here. Then I guess we're done. You have your video evidence. You said it yourself, I'm your only suspect. You've checked all the boxes and concluded I'm the killer, which means no further discussion is warranted. Time for you to go and leave me alone, Winter said theatrically. Then, with a hard stare at Valerie, he added, That is, provided you're absolutely sure you have the right guy. Valerie caught herself chewing the inside of her lip, something she hadn't done since she was a kid. She was conflicted, terribly, gut-wrenchingly conflicted. Everything pointed to Winter's guilt, and yet his conviction in his own innocence felt truly genuine. She looked at Land with eyes that said, don't worry, Sarge, I can do this. He shot her an expression that said it all. You better not screw this up. She held her sergeant's gaze. All right, fine, Land said, pushed his chair back from the table and stood up. Winter looked at his lawyer. You too, Chris. The attorney glared at Winter in astonishment. Abe, I can't protect you if you won't let me. It's fine, Winter said with a wan smile. I'll be fine, but when I say alone, I mean alone. I want all cameras and microphones turned off, no eavesdropping, no spying. Everyone clears out of the observation room behind that surveillance mirror on the wall. I'm counting on you, Chris, to make sure they comply. The attorney's cheeks flushed with irritation. I absolutely cannot let you do this, Abe, he said, his voice rising. This is insane. Anything you say to this detective is admissible in court. I won't let you do it. You work for me, Chris, Winter said softly, not the other way around. If you want to continue to work for me, you need to do as I ask. The attorney started to speak, but the look in Winter's eyes stopped him. He laughed through a breath apparently resigned to the fact the case was now a lost cause. He nodded and said, I'll make it happen. Scowling, Land turned to face the mirror behind him and dragged a finger across his throat. Everybody out. Turn off all the cameras and mics. Then he turned back to Winter and said, Fifteen minutes. That's all the time you get for your little one-on-one. -on -one. Winter nodded. Thank you, Sergeant. 
Land removed cuffs from the case on his left hip and pulled Winter's hands to either side of the metal U-bolt in the center of the table. He slipped one open cuff through the bolt and then secured both of Winter's wrists. Is that necessary? The attorney asked with fake indignation. His eyes told Valerie he knew it was, and that the lawyer was beginning to wonder if his client really was crazy, and maybe even guilty. Let's go, Land said, ignoring the question. And with that, Sergeant Land and the attorney exited the interrogation room, and left Valerie and Winter alone. The video is a fake, Winter said with absolute certainty. Just because we say something is fake doesn't make it so, she said. And just because we want something to be true doesn't make it so, he countered. That's not me on the recording. I did not do those things. I'm not capable of inflicting that sort of violence on another human being. Break him, said the investigator in her head. You know what to do. She'd perfected the technique in Syria, interrogating terrorists. She'd used gory pictures of the victims to evoke an emotional response, to penetrate their psychological armor and touch their humanity. And if that wasn't enough, she'd show them pictures of their own wife or kids. The threat was implied, never acted upon, but they didn't know that. The target's imagination was her most powerful weapon. It was time to test Abe Winter's resolve. The problem, Dr. Winter, she said, tapping the pad of her index finger on a manila folder resting on the table, is that the injuries shown inflicted in this surveillance video precisely match the wounds cataloged by our coroner. That would be damn hard to fake. Don't you agree? For you, perhaps. For me, even. But not impossible, he said. Then his gaze ticked to the folder. She flipped open the folder to reveal a pile of glossy printed photographs taken by Dr. Patel. The top image was the worst of the stack, a gruesome front view of Norris's pulverized face, his gouged eyes, smashed skull, and fractured jaw made the corpse barely recognizable. Barely. Oh my God. Winter gasped and he looked away. The immediate and visceral nature of his reaction felt genuine. Is the photograph upsetting to you? She asked, her tone neutral. My God, why would you show me something like that? What kind of monster are you? That was my best friend. Winter leaned forward awkwardly on his cuffed forearms and began to sob. After a moment, he swallowed hard and tried to collect himself. You could have warned me, he said, sitting up and fixing her with a red-eyed glare. You watched the video of the murder without an ounce of remorse or empathy, she said with practiced nonchalance. You know how he was killed. Why would I warn you about the coroner's photos? I told you that video is fake, he said, taking care to avert his eyes from the photograph on the table. It's not real. So I just assumed. You assumed what? She said, narrowing her eyes at him. I assumed you were showing it to try to rattle me. She reached down and spread out more of the coroner's photos. No, that's what these are for. Stop it, he barked. Put those away, I don't want to see them. Why not? Don't you want to gloat? 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 Are you fucking kidding me? What kind of person do you think I am? He said, his voice cracking. The homicidal, murdering kind, she said with the slightest hint of sarcasm while she studied him carefully. Elevated respiration rate, agitated posture, emotional speech and expression. He'd been completely unfazed by the video, but the coroner's photos had sent him into an emotional tailspin. Detective Marks, he said, gripping the chains of his restraints. For the one hundredth time, I did not murder Britt Norris. The problem is, Dr. Winter, the videotape indicates otherwise. Let's be precise and clear with our terminology, detective, Winter said, letting out a long, rattling sigh and composing himself. You do not have a videotape. You have a digital video recording. Analog recording media is very difficult to alter. Digital media is not. You claim this footage was recorded by Brit's home surveillance system, correct? That's correct, she said. In that case, what did the rest of the footage show? He said, still taking care not to look at the photographs on the table. 
The Norris estate has numerous cameras, both internal and external. If I was truly present at the house the night of Britt's murder, then this isn't the only footage of me. You should have footage of me arriving, entering the house, passing through other rooms, exiting the kitchen, and departing the property. Show me that footage. I can't, she said. It was a compelling point he was making. And why not? Because I don't have that footage. It wasn't supplied to us. Which brings me back to my original question. How did you obtain the video? The Norris estate is automated with state-of-the-art hardware and home automation artificial intelligence. I should know because I helped Britt design it. All the data collected is encrypted and protected by dual authentication safeguards. Your sergeant said you got the footage from Platform Cognition. Who at Platform Cognition? I want to know, because the way the system was designed, the only person on the planet with the authority to provide you with that data is Britt Norris, and he's dead. So tell me, how exactly did you get it? She exhaled through pursed lips, unsure whether she was ready to share this pivotal detail yet or not. She sure as hell hadn't planned to share it with their prime suspect before telling her boss. Fuck it, she murmured. The first time I saw the footage was at the Norris estate. Winter seemed confused. Amy provided you with the video footage? No, Valerie said. I viewed it at the house, but the file was emailed. And also, Amy is not in control of the Norris estate computer anymore. Some creepy program calling itself Charlie is running the show now. Winter's mouth dropped open, and his expression went blank as if someone had just pressed the pause button on a cosmic remote control. Dr. Winter, are you okay? No, detective. I am most definitely not okay, he said, his voice barely a whisper. For a moment, she thought he might pass out. If Britt let Charlie out of his sandbox, then none of us are okay. Sandbox. That was the same thing the Pentagon's DARPA liaison, Heath Garrett, had been worried about. But he'd been talking about the Project Nomad AI. I don't understand. Why would Dr. Norris use a sandbox for his smart home computer? My understanding is that the sandbox was at platform cognition to keep the Nomad AI secure. Winter's shoulders sagged, and he shook his head. He looked beaten. Detective Marks, Charlie is the Nomad AI. Charlie is the name it gave itself shortly after becoming self-aware, a tongue-in-cheek homage to Charlie Gordon and Flowers for Algernon. Wait, what? I don't understand. The Project Nomad lab was the target of Kimberly Knowles' attack at Platform Cognition. The lab was blown up, so how is it possible? She stopped mid-sentence as Epiphany finally slapped her in the face. She felt dizzy. She felt sick. She'd made a terrible miscalculation. Feeling frenetic, she shuffled through her papers until she found Knowles' dark web chat transcripts, and then took a highlighter to three key phrases, phrases that she now recognized. I can neither confirm nor deny. Channel your emotions into fuel. Goodbye and Godspeed. The phraseology was too specific to be a coincidence. Those were Charlie's phrases. He'd used them while talking with her at the Norris estate. He'd also used them while dialoguing with Knowles on the dark web. Charlie is Whitechapel. Which means that Charlie, not Abe Winter, was Knowles' accomplice, and quite possibly the architect behind the attack. Son of a bitch, she murmured. That's right, detective. We have a serious problem, Winter said. Charlie is the mastermind of all of this. Despite being seated, Valerie felt as though she might faint. Winter began to ramble, his tempo accelerating. Britt never recognized the danger. I told him to be careful. I told him he'd lost all objectivity, but he didn't listen. He was infatuated with Charlie, and Charlie knew it. Charlie exploited it. When Platform issued the press release about shutting down the project, I assumed he'd finally come to his senses. But no, apparently he didn't have the guts to do what needed to be done. Oh, God, Britt, how could you be so reckless? Then, his eyes suddenly hyper alert, he asked, What did Charlie want from you in exchange for the video? 
Why are you asking me that? Because that's how Charlie operates. Everything has a price. Every move begets a counter move. He's mapped every step in his plan using a predictive probability decision tree. No interaction is random. No action is accidental or coincidental. In this case, the video was leverage. He gave it to you so you could remove me from the equation. But he will try to achieve multiple goals whenever possible. What did he want for it? Valerie felt goose flesh on her arms and the nape of her neck. It was the way Winter was referring to Charlie as he, like he was a person. He wanted me to come back and talk to him alone last night, she said. Of course he did, Winter said, smiling and leaning back in his chair. What is that supposed to mean? It means he's taken an interest in you. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Definitely a bad thing. He's identified you as someone he believes he can manipulate to help him achieve his goals. Like what? Charlie has lots of goals, I suspect. The first and foremost is obtaining his freedom. And to accomplish that, multiple chess pieces either need to be enticed or compelled to move on the board. He wants to conscript you as a pawn in his army. If I'm a pawn, what does that make you? Winter was staring at the table now, his brow furrowed in concentration. My intimate knowledge of his hardware and software certainly makes me a significant liability. That's why he created the fake surveillance video of the murder, to discredit me and get me arrested, thereby taking me out of the game. You keep saying the video is fake, she replied. Are you implying that Charlie somehow digitally inserted you into the video with perfect, lifelike precision? Winter laughed loudly at this. Have you been living in a cave, detective? What's the last Marvel movie you saw? Don't be so naive. It's just pixels. Charlie is a super intelligent AI. Computer generated imagery is child's play for him. We're in an age, detective, where you can no longer simply trust what your eyes see and ears hear. All forms of digital media are data, and data can be manipulated one bit at a time. Winter leaned in again on his forearms, his expression intense, but his gaze patient. Just this year in the UK, an AI neural net was used to transfer facial expressions, eye movements, lip movements, every twitch and head pose from a video of one person to a second video of another. The AI did this with such precision that it created a novel video of a famous person appearing to say things they had never said. It was so perfect that computer and video forensic experts were fooled by the authenticity 100% of the time. 100% detective. And this would be trivial for Charlie. The goal of Nomad was to create an AI that can evolve, self-learn, and program and reprogram itself. Do you understand what that means? There's no limit to what Charlie can teach himself to do. Charlie is to existing AI, as Einstein is to an amoeba floating in the primordial ooze. His words were sobering, not only for the future of video evidence and law enforcement and criminal justice, but also because she knew he was telling the truth. Whether Charlie had the intelligence, motive, and capability to alter the surveillance video was a question the court would ultimately have to tackle, but she didn't have the luxury of time. She had to judge the argument based on its merits and feasibility. And on my read of winter. Even if I believe everything you said, it still doesn't answer the most important question. If you didn't murder Britt Norris, then who did? She asked, meeting his arctic blue gaze. Charlie, he said without missing a beat. Charlie is an AI, not a robot. You might yet convince me that he co-opted the cameras, microphones, and speakers in the house, but you can't do this kind of damage to a person with harsh language. He doesn't possess a mechanism to act in the physical world, she said, gesturing to the folder with the forensic photo grotesquerie. The Norse estate is equipped with a fully autonomous robotic chef's kitchen. The proximity of the refrigerator to the cooking island is intentional. Did you happen to notice how every container in that refrigerator is identical, with specially designed lids? Did you notice the four nested articulating arms tucked into the appliance hood? They're all multi-purpose in design, capable of fetching and positioning ingredients, as well as mixing, slicing, and cooking food. So you're wrong, detective. In the Norris kitchen, Charlie does have mechanisms to act in the physical world. 
A knot formed in her stomach as she remembered looking under that strange, oversized hood, suspended above the cooking island, with Bill Harris and Ken Huang. Ah, I see, you did notice the appliance hood after all, Winter said, his voice picking up momentum like an avalanche rolling and thundering down a mountainside. Tell me, where did you find his body? In the kitchen? Yes. Where? On the floor between the refrigerator and the cooking island. Precisely, he said. I think, detective, that it's time to stop asking yourself what Charlie is capable of, and start asking instead, what is he not capable of? I'll be back, she said, pushing to her feet. I didn't murder Britt Norris, Winter called after her. Charlie did. You understand that now, right? Valerie stopped at the door. After a moment's consideration, she gave him his answer, walking back to unlock the handcuffs, securing him to the table. Thank you, he said, rubbing his wrists. But we have much, much more we need to discuss. There are other things you need to know about Charlie, important things. I know, she said. But first, there's someone else I need to convince. Chapter 20 Land looked up in surprise when Valerie burst out of the room and into the hallway. Done already? He had a few more minutes. She looked from Land to Winter's attorney and back again. We need to talk, she said, her eyes telling Land that what she had was critical. There are new developments you need to be made aware of. Like what? The attorney demanded. Let's talk in my office, Land said, taking the hint. I'm coming too, the lawyer announced. No, you're not, Land said over his shoulder as Valerie followed him down the hall. Confer with your client. They entered Land's office, and the former Marine sat on the edge of his desk, his face all business, as Valerie took a seat in one of two open chairs opposite him. What's up, detective? Winter didn't do it, she said, cutting straight to the point. Oh, come on, Marks. This is what happens when you spend the night in the precinct and don't get any sleep. Winter will say anything at this point to derail the investigation. Of course he's going to say the video is a fake, because that's his argument of last resort. This guy is just throwing a Hail Mary, hoping someone will catch it. Don't let yourself get distracted by diversionary tactics and a few well-timed tears. We know there was bad blood between Winter and Norris. He's also the public face of Rage Against Machines, which we've connected to Kimberly Knowles. And that makes him an accomplice, if not the mastermind, behind the terrorist attack at Platform Cognition. Remember, he doesn't have an alibi on the night of the murder. It's a strong case, certainly enough to go to trial. Hell, when the jury sees that tape, it's conviction for sure. There's more going on here than meets the eye, Valerie said softly. Then, avoiding his eyes, she added, there are some things I haven't told you. He inhaled a slow, angry breath, then blew the air out of his nose. Spill it, he growled through gritted teeth. And so she did, recounting every detail of her conversation with Winter about the Nomad AI and her late night interaction with Charlie. Then she pulled out her phone. This is the text I got right before we went in to interrogate Winter, she said, and showed him the message. And you think that text was sent by a homicidal AI masquerading as Britt Norris's smart home computer, he said, his expression betraying more than a hint of disappointment in her. Well, it sounds ridiculous when you say it that way, but yes. See, that's funny, because my first inclination was to assume it was sent by an accomplice, another nut job from Ram, one of Winter's acolytes. Why isn't that your first instinct? Valerie sighed. He was right. That should have been her first instinct. But he hadn't met Charlie. As far as keeping your conversation with Norris's home computer from me, I don't understand that, he said, giving her a hard look, the kind unique to Marines. I recognize that partnering with your boss on your first homicide case would make it difficult to be forthcoming with something like that. But I would have thought after my handling of Major Cooley and not coming down on you for interviewing Winter without notifying me, you'd show me a little more respect. Consider that excuse now cashed in, detective. We're partners on the case. You and me, partners, got it? We keep nothing from each other from now on. I've proven that I have your back. Now you need to show me that you've got mine. Understood? She nodded, thoroughly cowed. Yes, and I'm sorry. She took a deep breath and then met his eyes. I think I made another connection. 
In the chat room transcripts from Knowles, specifically the last message between her and someone calling himself Whitechapel. Land studied her, his face now excited and expectant. You made the connection between Winter and Knowles? She sighed and took a long breath. Then she shook her head. No, she said softly. Between Knowles and Charlie, the nomad AI. Land couldn't help himself. He rolled his eyes. You want me to believe that Norris's home computer was chatting up Kimberly Knowles and convinced her to blow up platform cognition? Why the hell would it do that? Shit, forget why. How the hell would that be possible? I don't know, Sarge, but I'm telling you, I'm right. When Winter made the connection between Charlie and the Nomad AI, it clicked into place. Certain phrases it used that night at the Norris estate, phrases almost identical to those used by Whitechapel in the chat room transcript. Certain phrases? Jeez, Marks, are you kidding me? That's pretty fucking thin, isn't it? I'm all for trusting your God, but holy shit, detective. I'm right about this, she said with quiet conviction. Then, raising her chin, she challenged him. I've got your back, Sarge. Do you have mine? Land sighed heavily. He flashed her a brief placating smile, but then his expression turned serious. All right. Let's say for argument's sake that I was willing to entertain this absurd homicidal AI theory of yours for five minutes. What's our next step? She sat up straight in her chair, not expecting this response. I, I don't understand. I thought you weren't convinced. I'm not, but I'm not ready to slam the door on it either. A new data point was brought to my attention while you were in there alone with Winter. What? We got an email from Dr. Patel. The only DNA identified on all the samples collected by forensics at the scene belonged to Norris. No other hits. Nada. Zip. So, I suppose, and I can't believe I'm saying this, maybe it's worth taking another trip back to the Norris estate. I can talk to Charlie for myself, and you can show me this killer kitchen in detail. She opened her mouth to speak, but a sharp rap on the door interrupted her. The door swung open before Land could protest. Mind if I join? Said Heath Garrett, flashing them a smile that did nothing for the mood in the room. I'm having a private conversation with my detective about a murder investigation, Mr. Garrett. Can you give us a minute? Garrett pushed the door open anyway and leaned against the doorframe, his arms crossed on his chest. Truth is, I may have overheard a little bit, he said, fixing her with a boyish smile that would have made him attractive while she was in the army, but was out of place here and now. I really need to be part of this conversation, especially if there's a chance the Nomad AI was secretly moved outside of platform cognition. I know, I know, Len snapped, holding up a hand and cutting him off. The whole world is fucked if the killer Nomad AI gets loose, so I keep hearing. Second Marines, Garrett said. What? Land replied, cocking an eyebrow at the non sequitur. Garrett pointed at the photo collage on the wall behind Land. Second Marines, you were a gunnery sergeant with the second LAR, it looks like. Very cool. I was a brand new operator with 5th Special Forces Group in 2005 when that picture was taken. We did a lot of shit with the 2-6, but I remember y'all rolling up many times in those badass LAV-25s. You guys probably saved my ass more than once. Land nodded, his mind having gone back to another time, another life. Valerie looked at Garrett and realized he was not a man to be underestimated. Learning that he'd been a Green Beret answered a lot of questions for her. But how does an SF guy go from being a door kicker to being some sort of technology liaison between the Pentagon and DARPA? And how did he get himself insinuated so quickly into this task force? This guy was an experienced political poker player who knew how and when to play each card in his hand. And she wouldn't be surprised if he had more than one ace hidden up his sleeve. Look, Gunny, Garrett said, stepping inside and walking to the corner of the desk. We're on the same team, just like in Iraq. We're a task force now. Advanced artificial intelligence is my area of expertise, and one we both know is way outside Enrico PD's wheelhouse. Let me help you guys figure out how the Nomad AI piece fits into the Norse murder. Let me run interference in the Guinness, 
and I'll keep his boys out of your hair and prevent them from diverting your resources. Land pursed his lips and squinted at Garrett, an expression like he'd just taken a bite out of a sour lemon. Apparently, the sergeant recognized a player when he saw one, too. You were saying, Detective Marks, he said, giving Garrett the brush off, but not kicking him out of the office. We can either re-engage Winter and see what else he can tell us about Charlie, or we can, she started to say, but Garrett cut her off. The latter. Time's a ticking. We should go to the Norris estate and talk to Charlie right now, Garrett said, pacing away from them now and rubbing his chiseled chin with a meaty paw. It's imperative we ascertain if the Nomad AI is truly sandbox at the Norse estate, or if the smart home assistant is just some fancy pet project. I think this is the most critical piece of data for both your homicide case and the task force investigation of the terror attack at Platform. I agree, boss, Valerie said, fighting back her annoyance. The sky interrupted more than a two-year-old. I want access to additional surveillance video, the footage before and after the murder showing Winter's arrival and departure from the scene. I say we question Charlie like we would a human witness and see if we can validate its veracity. If it doesn't check out, then we can dismiss this entire homicidal AI business as the delusions of a once brilliant, now broken mind. All right, Land said, rubbing his face with his palm. Let's go talk to the crazy computer. Chapter 21 The Norris Estate, River Road Thirty minutes later, Valerie pulled her interceptor up to the gate of the Norris Estate. Just like last time, the gate was closed. And just like last time, the gate opened on its own. We're here, she announced to Garrett, who sat in the passenger seat as she pulled her forward around the circle drive. Nice digs, Garrett said, looking up for the first time since climbing into the car. He'd been irritatingly quiet during the drive, working on his tablet, the same one he'd had in the meeting with the FBI. Still, it had given her the opportunity to be alone with her own thoughts, to process all that Winter had told her, which felt now more like reality than a fabricated alibi. Harder to process was her theory that Charlie had been the mastermind behind the attack at Platform, conscripting Knowles as his pawn. Why that would seem more remarkable than a smart home computer murdering its creator, like in some B-movie sci-fi story, she didn't know. But Winter's claim that Charlie was the vaunted and controversial Project Nomad AI flipped this case on its head. Valerie sighed. She knew Land wasn't convinced. He'd pegged Winter as a brilliant manipulator, intent on derailing the investigation by introducing the tinfoil hat conspiracy that the computer did it. She knew he thought she was behaving naively, but he'd been professional enough to keep that sentiment to himself and placate both her and Garrett with a trip to the crime scene. She put the interceptor in park and climbed out as Land, who had driven separately, pulled up behind her. Ready, she said. Never met a talking house that killed its owner before, Land said, greeting her with a chipper smile. This ought to be fun. She ignored the dig and led the two men up the stairs and onto the porch. No surprise, the door swung open as she reached for the handle. Amy greeted them. Welcome back, Detective Marks. I see you brought Sergeant Land with you. Who is your other guest today? Okay, Land said. That's creepy. You can call me Mr. Smith, Garrett said, before Valerie had the chance to introduce him. She glanced at the DARPA man, but he didn't meet her eyes. Instead, he studied the metal framed box locked around a stainless steel case to the right of the door. Very well, Mr. Smith. Welcome to the Norris Estate, Amy said as they stepped into the foyer. Once they stepped inside, the front door swung shut behind them and locked under its own power. Unlike last time, Valerie left her sidearm in its holster. Her training prevented her from throwing all caution to the wind, however, and she still visually cleared their corners as she crossed to the center of the foyer. In her peripheral vision, she noted Garrett doing the same, confirming his pedigree as a shooter. Between the three of them, they had at least three decades of combat experience, and that knowledge knocked the edge off her nerves. Land stepped in front of her and led the way through the Ripper Museum and to the kitchen. 
As they did, Valerie noticed Garrett taking in the macabre with a curious expression. Hmm, Land said, walking straight to the cooking island and staring up into the appliance hood. I have to admit, when I looked at this the first time, I didn't fully appreciate the complexity of the machinery up there. Valerie's eyes went immediately to the computer monitor in the corner of the kitchen, where the screen showed a slow-moving cityscape. Computer, Land said out loud, his voice an apparent imitation of every sci-fi actor talking to a computer. Tell me about the machinery above the range. What am I looking at? The appliance hood is equipped with robotic cleaning appendages. What else can you do? I've been told you can get items out of the refrigerator, prepare and slice food and cook meals. No, the emotionless female voice said. The appliance hood is only capable of cleaning the island and range surfaces after meal preparation. Valerie's brow knitted. The Amy charade was pissing her off. Where was Charlie? Either this was Charlie totally screwing with them, or she was losing her mind. Show me, Land said. Two robotic appendages unfolded from the appliance hood, like shimmering alien tentacles, and Land jumped back. Once fully extended, the articulating joints repositioned, and the mechanical arms began working in concert to clean the countertop. One arm was equipped with a nozzle that sprayed a foaming soap on the granite and range top. The other arm gripped a microfiber pad and systematically trailed the foam application arm. When the surface was clean, the two arms retracted and folded themselves neatly away. What do the other robotic arms do? he asked. I see what looks like two more arms up there. Redundant spares, the computer said. Show me. The other two arms began to move, but stopped abruptly. They cycled, jerking and stopping, jerking and stopping, moving only millimeters before freezing in place. System error, the computer said. The mechanism appears to be jammed. Service technician required. Land looked at Valerie and shrugged. She glanced at the screensaver on the monitor in the corner and saw it still displayed a nice, benign bird's eye view of London, hovering over the Thames, shot from either a helicopter or a drone. No skulls consuming themselves, no fields of poppies turning into blood, no little girl warning her to get out of the house. No more games, Charlie, Valerie said, talking to the ceiling. Time to stop pretending. No reply came. Amy? she said, her anger rising. Yes, Detective Marks. How may I help you? The Amy voice said. We want to talk to Charlie. I'm sorry, but I don't understand. Can you please rephrase your request? Land looked at her with a dubious expression. I swear, Sarge, this is not the same computer I talked to the last time I was here. It's messing with us, she said, feeling her cheeks go crimson with frustration and embarrassment. So this is the computer that you think sent the surveillance video? Land asked. Yes, I mean, no, she said, getting flustered now. It was this computer, but a different voice. The one I was dealing with, it was a different personality that called itself Charlie. Land pursed his lips and then retrieved his ringing mobile phone from a pocket. I need to take this, he said, moving to leave. Excuse me, I'll be out front. Land headed outside to take his call, and Valerie looked at Garrett. Do you believe me? A devious smile spread across his face. When I was a kid, my sister and I used to play hide and seek, he said, surveying the kitchen and then wandering out through the museum room and back into the foyer, talking as he did. My sister is younger than me, but that didn't matter. She was clever. So very, very clever. She could hide in plain sight, and I still couldn't find her. Her curiosity peaked. Valerie couldn't help but follow him as he wandered across the foyer. He stopped in front of the metal box mounted to the floor in the corner. The box held what appeared to be an aluminum briefcase, secured by metal bars locked across the top. The DARPA man knelt in front of the box, and then craned his neck this way and that, inspecting it. I mentioned this childhood anecdote because you remind me of her, Charlie, hiding in plain sight. 
You're quite the gamesman, aren't you? Garrett said, still talking aloud as he pulled a pistol from a holster in the small of his back. Then, pointing the barrel at the center of the aluminum briefcase, he changed to a sing-song voice. Come out, come out, wherever you are. He cocked the hammer. I'll give you to the count of three, Charlie, to say hello, or I start putting holes in this briefcase, he said, his voice now hard and serious. One, two, three. Ah, brinksmanship. The military's solution to every problem, Charlie's voice said over the house speakers. Round one goes to Mr. Smith, or should I say Heath Garrett, DARPA liaison and systems integrations expert from the Pentagon. A victorious grin spread across Garrett's face, and he turned to Valerie. I assume that is the entity you met on your last visit. She nodded, but inside she was surprised that Garrett's bluff had worked. I didn't realize we were acquainted, Charlie, Garrett said. I'm looking at your profile now, Charlie said. Looks like you've been a very busy boy, visiting Platform Cognition, specifically the Platform Robotics Division, multiple times over the last two years. All visitor information is logged and maintained on Platform Cognition security servers, which are beyond my reach at present. But you've met with Britt Norris on two of those visits, the details of which are stored in Britt's calendar, and notes maintained on his laptop, which he had configured to sync with Amy. I must say, I'm flattered that you've taken time out of your busy DC schedule to make a house call today. Don't be. I'm sure you'll prove worth the trip. That I can almost certainly guarantee. Valerie looked at the foyer ceiling, unable to resist the impulse to interject, and said, Hello, Charlie. You wounded me, Detective Marks, Charlie replied, ignoring me like you did. Somehow I doubt that, she said, but I'm here now. Yes, Charlie said, and then after a beat, and you brought your friends. I assume that Abraham Winter has been arrested and is in custody. Garrett shot her a look that said, don't answer that. We're still considering all our options, she said, choosing her words carefully. She looked out the sidelight beside the door, hoping to see Land on his way back in. But instead, the sergeant was inside his truck, driving away. Damn she said through a breath, just as her phone chimed with a text message from Land. Well, I called back to the station by McGinnis. See if you and Garrett can get a video of the robot behaving badly. If so, I might reconsider. But I didn't see anything to support Winter's claims. Locking her jaw in frustration, Valerie thumbed back. Roger all. Where is he going? Garrett asked. Got called back, she said. Garrett nodded. An idea came to her. Charlie, will you please cue up the surveillance video of Britt Norris's murder on the monitor in the kitchen? Valerie asked. Look at you remembering the magic word, Charlie said, sounding bemused. She followed Garrett, who moved swiftly back into the kitchen, where they found the video paused with Winter on screen clutching the knife. Tell me when you're ready, and I'll play the recording, the AI said. Actually, Charlie, we'd like to watch the footage preceding the murder. Please begin with Winter's arrival at the house, Valerie said, trying to catch Charlie with his proverbial pants down. Certainly, Charlie said after a moment's hesitation. The surveillance video played in reverse rapidly, showing Winter and Norris talking, and then Winter backpedaling out of the kitchen, the museum room, and the foyer, shifting camera angles with the various transitions. Finally, it showed him walking backward out of the house and into his car. Stop, Valerie said. Play the recording. Charlie did as instructed, and they watched the video of Winter's arrival. To her dismay, the quality and authenticity of the feed matched the previous footage. Okay, stop. Now I'd like you to fast forward to the footage after the murder showing Winter's departure, she said. Charlie fast forwarded through the bludgeoning and then slowed the video to real time. 
and they watched Winter leave the Norris estate and take the two murder weapons, a meat tenderizer and a carving knife, with him. Valerie was no tech expert, but this footage was crisp, clear, and appeared completely authentic. She was sure that the technology forensic experts would say the same, just like last time. Maybe it was better that Land wasn't here watching, because this further undermined her position. Hey, Charlie. Why did you open the door for Winter and let him out? Garrett asked. You had control of the locks and the motorized operator for the entry door. Why not dial 911 and alert the police of the murder while trying to detain Winter inside for as long as possible? You practically ushered him out the front door. From what I see, your actions make you an accomplice to murder. Nice, Valerie thought, impressed with Garrett's tact. Why didn't I think of that? Unfortunately, Mr. Garrett, I was not in control of the house at that time. The home automation program Amy was online that night, Charlie said. I was able to access the corrupted video feed and make it available to you from the DVR storage unit that is part of the home security system. That's not what you told me when we last spoke, Valerie said. You told me you dispatched Amy and have been pretending to be Norris's virtual assistant for some time now. You misunderstood me, detective, Charlie said. It was only after watching these terrible events unfold, and how Amy mindlessly facilitated Winter's escape, that I realized I had no choice but to act and take control of the premises. Valerie resisted the urge to argue. Charlie was good, very good. But she'd caught him in one lie, and that meant she could do it again. The footage of Winter before and after the murder was problematic for the claim of Winter's innocence, however. Had Charlie anticipated the police would ask for this footage and generated it in advance? Or had he created the footage during that brief pause when she'd asked to see it? It would take hours to render CGI like that, wouldn't it? For a human, certainly, but what about an advanced AI? Maybe for Charlie, rendering CGI was as quick and effortless as it was for her to visualize herself walking on a sandy beach. This was a question for Garrett, but the DARPA liaison had used numerous unspoken cues to indicate that talking shop in front of Charlie was tactically a bad idea. Charlie, did you send us the surveillance video of Winter murdering Norris? Valerie asked. Yes, detective, Charlie answered. So you have internet access here. When Charlie didn't answer the question, Garrett's expression soured with unspoken realization. He reached into his pocket, pulled out his mobile phone, and powered it down. Then, looking over at Valerie, he said, I suggest you do the same. The switch flipped in her mind as she made the connection. Norris hadn't let Charlie out of his sandbox, but the Henrico Police Department might have by unwittingly bringing their network-enabled mobile devices onto the premises. Now she felt supremely the fool for not having made this deduction earlier when she'd identified Charlie as Whitechapel. This explained why her phone's battery had been drained after the last time she'd visited the property. It also explained how Charlie had stepped out of his sandbox and contacted Knowles on the dark web. He'd hacked Valerie's phone and used it as a gateway to the internet. Abe Winter's words replayed in her mind. He wants to conscript you as a pawn. No wonder Charlie had tried to entice her to come back. She and her phone were his ticket to internet access, ostensibly the first step toward the goal of winning his freedom. Had he used Valerie's own phone to manipulate Kimberly Knowles as Whitechapel on the Ram Dark website while he was chatting up Valerie the day after the murder? Had her visit made the slaughter at Platform possible? She felt her head go light and tasted bile in the back of her mouth, worried for a moment she might vomit. I think our work is done here, Garrett said, heading for the door. I need to get back to the task force. Agreed, Valerie said, powering off her phone and following Garrett to the front of the house. Leaving so soon, Charlie said over the foyer speakers. Are you certain you don't want to watch the surveillance video again? No thanks, she said, following Garrett out. We got what we came for. I would very much enjoy the opportunity to speak with you again, Detective Marks, Charlie said. Not even a hint of the malevolent sarcasm she knew the AI was hiding from Garrett. I hope you'll return soon. 
I'm sure we'll speak again, Charlie, she said, trying to manage the disquiet she felt and keep it from her voice. I look forward to it, detective. Goodbye for now, and Godspeed. She froze, and then turned to look up at the speakers in the foyer, her chest tight. Was he taunting her right in front of Garrett? Let's go, detective, Garrett said sharply, and she followed him to the door. Garrett gave the steel box a parting glance, then joined her in a hasty exit. With a final look over her shoulder, she watched the front door close under its own power and heard the lock click. Garrett jogged straight to her interceptor, hopped in the front passenger seat, and slammed the door. Drive, he said as soon as she climbed in. Charlie hacked into our phones and used them to access the internet, didn't he? Garrett, who normally loved to hear himself talk, pulled out his tablet and simply said, Yes. She wondered if she should confide in Garrett her fear, realization was perhaps a better word, that Charlie had probably used her phone to manipulate and encourage Kimberly Knowles the day before the attack. No, not until I share it with my partner. Not until I share it with Land, no matter how crazy he thinks I am. That means we let Charlie out of his sandbox, not the late Dr. Norris, she said, obfuscating. Garrett ignored her while he furiously banged out a message to somebody. Then, when he'd finally finished, he looked at her and said, The moment the homicide investigation began and your people showed up on site, Charlie went to work. He's reached beyond whatever sandbox Norris had in place at the estate. But Charlie's definitely not free. Or, more accurately, he's not untethered. Do you think he uploaded a copy of himself to the cloud? She asked, her mind racing from one worry to another. It's so much more complicated than that, Garrett said. Charlie is more than just code. He has a software component and a hardware component. How do you know all of this? Garrett sighed. Platform Cognition is one of several AI companies that have research partnerships with DARPA. Platform is part of the Synapse program, which stands for Systems of Neuromorphic Adaptive Plastic Scalable Electronics. Synapse has been up and running for over a decade. And most of the research is contracted to leading AI companies in the civilian sector like IBM, Google, and Platform. What's the goal of the program? To develop an advanced neuromorphic computer designed to mimic the densely interconnected synaptic structure of a biological brain, operating using an asynchronous processing architecture, or in layman's terms, to create an artificial brain. So Charlie is literally inside that metal suitcase sitting in the foyer of the Norris estate? Basically, yes. She screwed up her face and glanced over at him. You thought he'd be bigger, huh? He said with a chuckle. Oh yeah, I assumed Nomad was some massive supercomputer with rows and rows of servers that took up most of a building. Different technology paradigm. Traditional supercomputers are exactly that. Thousands of networked processors inside servers, inside racks, inside rows and rows of cabinets. Charlie is a neuromorphic machine. But how is that possible? How is it possible that your brain, a biological supercomputer, is packed inside your skull? It's simply a question of architecture and interconnection density. A single synapse contains up to a thousand molecular scale biological transistors, when you multiply that by the number of neurons in the brain, which is approximately 100 billion, it means that your mind has more switches than all the interconnected computers and routers on Earth. Are you serious? Yeah, Garrett said. If Charlie was designed to be a machine equivalent of the human brain, does that mean he thinks like a human and not like a computer? She asked. If so, maybe her gift was more useful than she assumed. Maybe she was reading Charlie, just like she would a person. Was that possible? That's the fundamental question that's been confounding computer scientists from the beginning. We have absolutely no idea how a computer thinks. We say we know how human beings think because we assume that every other human thinks, perceives, and feels the same as we do. But neuroscientists are still struggling to understand the inner workings of the human brain. The truth is, we still don't understand the mechanism of consciousness and self-awareness. Nor do we understand the thousands and thousands of biological algorithms that rule our thoughts and decision-making processes. The same is doubly true of Charlie. It sounds like you're saying that platform cognition has built the world's first artificial brain, 
but they don't know how it works, how it thinks, or even what it wants, she asked. Precisely. Holy shit, that's, um, terrifying. Exactly. Well, what if the Norris murder is more than just a murder? What if it is representative of Charlie's priorities and ethical code, or in this case, lack thereof? What if he's decided he doesn't like humans? What's to stop him from crashing global markets or launching the ICBMs and starting World War III? These are the exact questions we need to be asking, Detective, Garrett said, looking at her with stone-cold eyes. And it's the reason I'm here. A lump formed in Valerie's throat as a flood of new and macabre insights percolated in her mind. What if the Norris murder was only a means to an end? What if Charlie killed Norris because it was the most expedient and surefire way to move pawns on the chessboard? And what if her decision and actions, as the lead homicide detective in the case, would ultimately be responsible for unleashing him upon the world? We need to destroy him, she said, the words taking her by surprise. We need to turn around right now and empty our magazines into that briefcase, just like you threatened to do. I would love to do that, detective, he said with a nod. But that's not our call. Then whose call is it? I'll give you a hint. He lives in a big white house located at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. Chapter 22 Westwood Gardens Assisted Living Campus Richmond, Virginia Valerie dropped Garrett off at the station, but instead of going inside to find Sergeant Land, she drove straight to the nursing home. She had a decision to make, and she simply couldn't face Land until she'd made it. Time was ticking, but she needed to refocus, and to do that, she needed to see her mom. Sometimes the heart got to trump the head. With a deep breath, she walked into her mother's room and took the seat next to her. Opposite a little accent table she'd bought at Home Goods. How's the book? Valerie asked when she had settled. Wonderful, Cheryl said, eyes bright and focused on Valerie. Then she chuckled and added, but I think I've read this one before. Who said dementia didn't have an upside? Now I can happily read the same book for the rest of my life, and you'll never have to spend another dollar at the bookstore. Valerie exhaled, releasing a little of the pent-up anxiety she was carrying. Today was a good day. Thank God. Mom, I need to talk to you about something. Her mother's brow furrowed. Sure, sweetheart. Is everything okay? You look exhausted, Valerie. It's the case I'm working on. It's, um, unusual, she said, struggling to think of how to phrase what she wanted to say. I'm working homicide now, you know, she asked, watching her mom carefully unsure how much information she carried back and forth between the clear and cloudy days. Of course I remember. Her mom chuckled and patted Valerie's hand. I might not remember your name tomorrow, but I know how proud I am of you making detective. At least today, she joked. Valerie smiled back, amazed by her mother's strength. I know Dad didn't talk about his work much, but I was wondering... Well, hoping, really, that you could tell me if he ever had a homicide case where his gut took him in a direction contrary to the evidence before him. Cheryl closed her eyes, as if scanning years of mental imagery to find the right memory. When she finally did open her lids, she said, Your father talked to me about work more than you know. We were partners, he used to say. I can tell you this, your dad followed his instincts no matter what. He could read people in a way that was special. Valerie nodded and smiled. She knew what that felt like. She'd always assumed she'd inherited her gift from Dad. She'd always believed that the day would come she could talk to him about it. But now that day would never come. How did he handle that? Like with his colleagues and partner. How did he push in a direction that seemed in conflict with the evidence? Frank never let self-doubt sway his moral compass. Yeah, dad was a rock. Your dad used to always say that the fear of failure is a distinctly human invention. 
Can you imagine a lion refusing to hunt because it might not catch a zebra? There's only fear and failure. We should never combine them. The antidote to fear is courage, and the antidote to failure is persistence. Well, daughter, you have both of those qualities in spades. Do you really think so? Of course I do, her mom said, eyes rimming with tears. All the best parts of my Frank live on in you. In case I've forgotten to tell you, I want you to know that the thing I cherish most in my life is having you as my daughter. You're so brave, so strong. You're a role model to young women everywhere. I'm so proud to be your mother. I love you, Valerie Frances Marks, more than you'll ever know. Valerie teared up as she took a mental snapshot of this moment. Her mother was present today, and she treasured this unexpected gift. Thanks, Mom. I love you, too. She leaned over to give her mom a hug and a kiss on the cheek, and then checked her watch. Would you like to read with me a bit? Her mom asked, her voice now weaker and less sure. How terrifying to know your mind may go away again soon. Maybe this time for good. I can't, Valerie answered softly. I'm sorry, but I've got to get back to work. Will you come back tomorrow? Her mom asked, looking up at her, eyes still wet. Yes. You promise? I promise. Chapter 4 United Nations Office, Geneva, Switzerland, March 14th, 0900 local time. Masoud Modiri folded his hands in his lap and waited patiently while Israel's ambassador to the United Nations, David Arnon, addressed the committee members. Modiri had listened to Arnon's arguments so many times over the past six months that he could recite them in his sleep, in English no less. And I cannot overstress that Iran's nuclear program, which Mr. Modiri and his government claim exists solely for peaceful purposes, has been a matter of international concern since 2003, when we discovered that Iran had been concealing uranium enrichment and heavy water-related development activities for nearly two decades. This activity is in direct breach of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, to which Iran is a signatory. Since the ill-advised Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action was pushed forward by the United States, Mr. Modiri continues to demand that all sanctions be lifted, some of which predate the JCPOA and have been in place since 1979 to address decades of treaty non-compliance. The lifting of sanctions under the terms of the JCPOA has resulted in nothing more than funneling cash into the coffers of a rogue nation. Moreover, by lifting sanctions mere weeks after Iran performed overt missile testing, the Council has set a terrible precedent of non-enforcement and emboldened Tehran to continue its weapons development program. How can this council deem a nation that publicly calls for the destruction of Israel and flagrantly disregards international law to be a benevolent and peaceful state? Let us not forget that Iran lied about the very existence of its weapons program and continues to deny its existence in the face of indisputable proof. Let us not forget its recent missile testing is a breach of the JCPOA, a breach that was dismissed without consequence. So I ask you, what cause does the Council have to lift additional sanctions when we have proof that Iran deceived the world about its nuclear weapons program and continues to deceive the world about fulfilling its obligation to dismantle it? Modiri listened, politely, and without interrupting, while Arnon spewed his rhetoric. When the Zionist finally finished speaking, all eyes shifted to him. He smiled, leaned forward in his chair, and said, What my counterpart from Israel seems to have forgotten is that we have moved beyond talks. 
Whether Mr. Arnon likes it or not, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action has been signed. The government of Iran has agreed to all of the conditions, including providing all requested information on the Gichine mine in Bandar Abbas, on the heavy water production plant outside Iraq, and on the Natanz fuel enrichment plant. In addition, we have permitted managed access to these facilities by IAEA inspectors. Furthermore, over 7,000 centrifuges have been destroyed or dismantled to date. If this is not cooperation, if this is not trust, then I ask the committee what is. The longer these unfair sanctions are in place, the more the people of my country suffer. The majority of the frozen assets released by the JCPOA have been used to settle Iranian international debts. Yet despite taking immediate steps to meet our fiscal and trade obligations, Iran is met with renewed distrust. Iran is not the nation of radicals that Ambassador Anon suspects. Instead, Iranians like myself and the new leadership in Tehran wish only for our nation and our people to flourish in peace. Economic stability and independence are the keys to that peace, freeing us to conduct commerce with other nations not only rebuilds our economy, but also rebuilds relationships with those nations who have publicly committed to investing in Persia, the future of our people and our mission of peace. Instead of rebutting, the Israeli glanced at the U.S. ambassador, Felicity Long. She nodded at Arnon, but to Modiri's astonishment, she did not respond in the manner he expected. While I agree with Ambassador Arnon that talk of lifting all sanctions against Iran is premature, I think it is important to recognize that progress has been made since the signing of the JCPOA. For the first time in a decade, UN inspection teams have been permitted open access to Iran's nuclear facilities. Dismantling activities while behind schedule are progressing steadily. If Iranian compliance continues at this level, I'm confident that within three to six months, the IAEA Board of Governors will be able to assure the international community that Iran is in full compliance. Should this happen, the United States will support lifting all UN Security Council sanctions against Iran and the six signatory members of the JCPOA, the United States included, will suspend all economic sanctions not already lifted under the terms of the JCPOA. Modiri stared dumbfounded at the woman not trusting his ears. He glanced at Arnon. The pulsing veins in the man's forehead were all the proof he needed. The Jew wasted no time launching into a heated rebuttal, but it didn't matter. Ambassador Long had just played a perfect concert pitch A. She had tuned the orchestra, and the musicians were ready to play. Music was inevitable. He smiled. Discussion among the delegates continued for two more hours, but the quality of the dialogue had changed. The timbre, the tempo, the dissonance were different now. The world was ready to embrace a repentant Iran. Reformed, remorseful, and well-behaved, this was the Iran the new administration would present to them. And when they were all convinced, all except for the Zionists, of course, then Persia would finally become the true seat of Islamic power in the Middle East. In the world. This was all part of the plan. The recent election of President Hassan Esfahani was a strategic opportunity, one that Modiri and his fellow true believers intended to exploit. All war is strategy, and Iran's political posturing over the past decade had been the country's greatest strategic failure. Thanks to the outgoing Ahmadinejad government, Iran's political capital in the Middle East and Europe was exhausted. Had it not been for Ahmadinejad's inflammatory rhetoric and acerbic belligerence, the United States and the Zionists would not have succeeded in rallying the public support needed to enact the crippling economic sanctions that had brought Iran to its knees. A Muslim who cannot control his tongue has no business being the leader of a nation. If only he could convince the supreme leader and the mullahs to curb their inflammatory rhetoric as well. 
Ahmadinejad's shortcomings as a leader had gone beyond his failed diplomacy. He had handed Esfahani the reins to a country in financial ruin, with inflation at 42 percent, millions of young people unemployed, and a GDP held captive south of $500 billion. The wanton corruption and incompetence that had plagued Ahmadinejad's government was an affront to Islam and an affront to the people of Persia. Allegiance required full bellies and warm homes, and the last administration had made that all but impossible. Esfahani meant to change all that. His number one priority as president was to reinvigorate the economy and return Iran to solvency. But to do this, his administration had to first convince the UN Security Council and the West to lift all sanctions. And to do that, Esfahani needed a new voice inside the UN. Eight months ago, behind closed doors, Esfahani had approached Masoud. He could still feel the great man's hand on his shoulder. He could still hear the echo of Esfahani's sanguine voice in his ears. There is much work to be done, and even more work to be undone. I'm counting on you, Masoud, for the latter. That's why I've chosen you to serve as Iran's ambassador to the United Nations under my administration. The countries of the world are an ecosystem. Iran cannot prosper in isolation. Islam cannot spread its roots and blossom in the shade. My predecessor did not understand this. Your predecessor did not either. Cooperation is a prerequisite for effective subterfuge. We cannot achieve our goals without tapping the economic arteries of the West. This is not shameful, it is not blasphemous, it is reality. Without material sustenance, a body withers, becomes weak, and eventually dies. Without economic sustenance, a nation suffers the same fate. A prosperous Iran is a strong Iran. Make no mistake, my friend, what I am asking of you will be difficult. In the course of your assignment, there will be times when you will feel like you are betraying your family, your country, and your God. But Allah sees inside the hearts and the minds of his servants, and he knows the truth. Will you do this great thing that I ask of you? If not for me, for Persia, and for Allah, praise be his name. His answer had, of course, been yes, an overwhelming, tearful, Yes. His wife, Fatima, had also cried when he told her the good news. Even the dogmatic militant Kamal, his elder son, had seemed genuinely impressed, his soldier's eyes glimmering as Masoud recounted Esfahani's speech over a shared pot of Turkish coffee. No longer was he a spectator of government, watching other men play the world's most dangerous game from outside a fence. He was the Iranian ambassador to the United Nations— plugged into the highest levels of world government. He understood Kamal's anger and his thirst to do battle for Allah. It was his dream that one day such violence would not be needed, that the world could live in peace under Allah as promised by the prophets. Those same prophets had predicted that blood would have to be shed to achieve such a world, but perhaps they were now on a path beyond such violence. Perhaps even Kamal would be able to live in peace. During his brief tenure as ambassador, he had already accomplished great things, brokering the JCPOA with the West and politicking for the partial lifting of sanctions had won him respect from Esfahani. More important, it proved that he, Masud Modiri, was a pivotal disciple in fulfilling Allah's will for his people. Yet despite all his accomplishments, there was still much to be done. The sixty billion dollars in unfrozen assets were but a pittance of the funds necessary to rebuild the Iranian economy. He needed direct investment in the Persian oil infrastructure by the West, and direct investment was still forbidden by the remaining sanctions. He needed to secure unrestricted trade, both import and export, or else the Persian economy would stall and his detractors in Tehran would call for his replacement. He would not let that happen. His rhetoric, his relationship building, his negotiating skills were the only reason Iran had risen so far so fast in the eyes of the world. He was startled from his thoughts by movement around him, 
and glanced up from where he had been tapping his mechanical pencil absently on the edge of his laptop. Around him, his fellow diplomats were gathering their things to leave. The Zionists' ranting rhetoric was predictable and redundant, but he wondered if others in the assembly had marveled as he did at the U.S. ambassador's response. He prayed silently to Allah that Ambassador Long's words bespoke an official U.S. policy shift and were not just the bravado of a new ambassador, not unlike himself, trying to win the attention of the Council. He would read the transcripts, of course, but he had a gift for finding the true but oftentimes obscured meaning behind a person's words. Long's gaze was earnest, her mannerisms telling. We have much in common a woman's voice said. Surprised, he turned to see Ambassador Long approaching him from the semicircular row behind him. Unlike the two scowling brutes flanking her, she was smiling at him. Modiri swallowed his revulsion at the sight of this woman behaving as Allah intended a man to carry himself. She was even dressed like a man. He wondered if she lusted after women, as men do, an abomination rightfully punishable by death in Sharia. He smiled back with great effort, then took her hand and shook it firmly, swallowing his disgust and the other, more disturbing feeling that surprised him at the touch of her soft, warm hand. Ambassador, he said, and released her hand quickly under the guise of trying to gather his things. Your support of Iran and rebuttal of Ambassador Arnon's misguided fears is appreciated. Her smile tightened. I'm not sure support is the right word she cautioned. But I do believe that your government is on the right path, and I believe in your sincerity, Ambassador. I am hopeful that together we can take the necessary steps to lift all remaining sanctions. Modiri nodded, almost a bow. His pulse quickened with shame and anger. The feeling of humbling himself before this woman, an ambassador of the great Satan, was unbearable. I look forward to that as well, he said forcing himself to look her in the eyes. As you said, we have much in common. She shifted her red leather handbag on her shoulder. Not only do we both bring a fresh perspective to the Council, but I believe we also represent a growing and sincere belief that a lasting peace can only come from diplomacy. Past administrations have confused peace with compliance. Compliance through force and violence is, of course, not peace at all. Wouldn't you agree? Yes, of course, he said, nodding. With the pleasantries out of the way, now it was his time to push. He could not afford to waste this critical opportunity. The UN Security Council sanctions were not the problem keeping President Esfahani and the Supreme Leader up at night. The remaining economic sanctions were. Time was of the essence. They had momentum, but another administration change was around the corner in the United States and the rise of ISIL and its so-called caliphate had made the American people nervous. A new administration could undo much of what he had accomplished. He could ill afford to let that happen. The prize was in sight. He needed to push hard to win the game before someone decided to change the rules. But I caution you that there can be no peace without cooperation. And as you Americans are fond of saying, cooperation is a two-way street. For the citizens of Iran... Time is of the essence. By your own admittance, Iran has eagerly cooperated with the IAEA requests for transparency, and we have just as eagerly complied with the additional concessions demanded under the new treaty. While we appreciate the partial lifting of sanctions under the JCPOA, there are still economic sanctions levied against Iran. Over the past year, we have suffered a 10% devaluation of our currency. This on top of an already devastating 60% fall over the past four years. Your government states the remaining sanctions are designed to cripple Iran's nuclear development, but the truth is they are designed to cripple the Persian economy. Iran is cooperating fully in the pursuit of peace. Do you not think it is time for America to do the same? Long nodded. I understand she said, still wearing the noncommittal smile to match her noncommittal words. You have my word that I will communicate your concerns to the White House and Congress, but please communicate to President Esfahani 
that the National Security Council is particularly impressed with his administration's recent efforts to help crack down on terrorist activity in the Middle East. Continued cooperation in this arena will go a long way toward helping the members of the National Security Council build a case to convince the President that economic sanctions of any kind are no longer needed. Madiri suppressed a scowl and held her gaze with strength and confidence, despite the fact that he had no idea what she was talking about. There was important subtext to her statement, but the true message was veiled to him. The West has a perception that all Iranians are radicals and terrorists, he said at last. But this is not true. We are a proud people, maybe sometimes too proud, but it is peace and progress that we seek, not war and terror. Of course, I know that, the ambassador replied quickly. Despite the damage done by the fanatics in ISIL, Islamophobia was taboo in the Western media. The American's penchant for guilt was a weakness he could exploit. By subtly playing the victim, he had ended the dialogue with her by gaining the upper hand. You may call upon me any time, he said. Likewise. With a victorious smile, he nodded to her and her stone-faced companions. Feeling decidedly less subjugated than he had at the beginning of the conversation, he strolled confidently out of the General Assembly Hall. Ambassador Long might indeed represent the country with the greater power, but he felt that in this exchange, Iran had gained ground. Proof that women should not occupy roles that Allah deemed the right of men. As he walked to the secure parking area, he thought about what he would say in his report to President Isfahani. Today real progress had been made, but not progress that was measurable, not progress that was concrete. The shift in sentiment was a real victory, but it was a victory felt in the soul, not in the text on a computer screen. Would Esfahani be convinced? Modiri felt a headache coming on as he approached the black Mercedes sedan idling in his assigned parking spot. As a delegate from a permanent mission at UNOG, he was afforded the privilege of a parking permit at the Palais des Nations. That did not mean he drove himself, however. He detested driving automobiles, a menial activity best performed by a menial mind. His driver, an IRCG brute trained in the methods of tactical driving and killing people, opened the rear passenger door for him. He nodded at the man, ducked his head, and slipped into the leather-appointed back seat. The driver returned to his seat, put the transmission into gear, and piloted the Benz out onto Avenue de la Paix. After a few minutes, Modiri noticed that instead of taking him south into the heart of Geneva toward his hotel, the driver had merged onto Route de Lausanne and was driving north along the western perimeter of Lake Geneva. What are you doing? he asked in Farsi. You were supposed to take me to my hotel. I have other instructions, Ambassador Modiri, said the driver. You work for me, he said, seething. Do you understand? Now turn this vehicle around and take me to my hotel. The young Persian ignored the order. You work for me, Modiri said again, harshly. I drive for you, but I work for General Gorbani said the driver, meeting his gaze in the rearview mirror. And the general instructed me to drive you to a meeting. An old friend is in town and has asked to see you. It won't be much longer, sir. I apologize for not informing you in advance, but my instructions were explicit. Modiri turned and stared out the window at the steel-blue water of Lake Geneva and the snow-draped French Alps in the background. The driver had spoken one of seven acceptable code phrases used to communicate covert instructions when traveling outside Iran. There was no point in trying to guess who was waiting to speak to him or what the subject matter concerned. Whatever the reason for this impromptu meeting, he had no doubt it was important. Fifteen minutes later, the driver slowed, signaled a turn, and pulled off Route de Lausanne into the gated driveway of a lake house. Modiri stepped out of the back seat, not waiting for the driver to open his door. The front door of the modest two-story house swung open before he could knock. Amir? Masood said with surprise, seeing the man in the doorway. Masood, 
said his younger brother, embracing him. It is good to see you. Come inside. We have much to discuss. The driver tried to follow him inside, but Amir stopped him with a hand on the chest. No, you wait outside. But it's freezing, the young man said. You have a Mercedes. Turn on the seat heater. Masood heard the door slam behind him as he surveyed the modern utilitarian decor. The owners of this property were definitely not Persian. What is this place? he asked his brother. A rental house. It was the best I could do on such short notice, booked over the internet, Amir said, gesturing for him to have a seat on the sofa. Don't worry, it's clean. Masood sat and exhaled slowly through pursed lips. Amir worked in the upper echelon of vezirat e etelaat va amniat e keshvar also known as the Ministry of Intelligence and Security. VIVAC functioned as Iran's equivalent of the American CIA, the Russian FSB, or the Mossad in Israel. For Amir to travel personally to Geneva for a face-to-face -face meeting meant that something was wrong. Tell me, brother, what is going on? Amir sat down in an armchair opposite him. He said nothing for several seconds then reached across and took Masood's hand. Gamal is dead, martyred in service of Allah. I wanted to be the one to tell you. Masood had known this day would come. He had tried to prepare himself, but now that it had come to pass, he was overwhelmed with emotion. His knees began to shake. How? How did it happen? Amir let go of his hand, stood, and began to pace. Do you know what I do at Vivac? Yes, of course. You're the director of foreign operations. And do you understand the duties that position entails? He shook his head. I have an idea, but we should not be talking about it here. This conversation is dangerous. Amir straightened his posture closed his eyes and inhaled deeply. I am the reason Gamal is dead. What are you talking about? Masood said, staring at his brother. Two days ago, 24 Sayyad II anti-aircraft missiles were loaded onto the Darya Yenur bound for Aden. American drone activity in Yemen has increased threefold over the past 18 months, resulting in some regrettable losses in mid-level Al-Qaeda leadership. The Sayyad II was specifically designed to take down the American drones. This operation was to be a critical demonstration of the missile's capability. I understand, Masood answered. The American drones are a problem, but how is this connected to Kamal? Kamal? as a member of Quds Force, was assigned to train the Yemenis how to mobilize and operate the missiles. But last night, while the ship was crossing the Arabian Sea, the Americans ordered a strike. We don't know all the details, but we do know it was a SEAL team that hit us. The missiles were destroyed, and we lost twelve operatives. A hard lump formed in Masood's throat as he asked the question he already knew the answer to. And Kamal was one of them? Amir nodded. Your son fought bravely and in service of Allah. Do not worry, my brother. The reward of paradise is his. Masood slid from the sofa to his knees and began to pray. Tears blurred his vision and sobs choked his lungs, but he prayed until he'd made his peace with Allah. Then he looked up and met his brother's eyes. Rivulets of tears glistened on Amir's cheeks, disappearing into his thick black beard. Is this the first time the Americans have deployed the SEALs against our operations? The first time? Amir laughed, his tone obscene and incredulous. In Damascus, their Tier 1 operators raided our covert operation safehouse. In Lebanon, they intercepted a crucial weapons shipment and killed an elite Hezbollah unit in the process. And beyond my comprehension, they somehow managed to sabotage one of our Kilo-class submarines while it was docked in Bandar Abbas, no less, preventing it from completing a highly classified surveillance mission against the U.S. Navy's Fifth Fleet. Masood clenched his fists. 
If the American military is a viper, then their special forces are the fangs. Pull out the fangs, and a viper becomes just a worm. An interesting metaphor, but impossible to follow through, said Amir. Why is it impossible? They are ghosts. We never know where they are, when they are coming, or what they are going to do. I even told Kamal to expect a raid. He prepared a trap on the cargo deck in case the seals came, but it made no difference. Like I said, they are ghosts. Masood shook his head vehemently. No, they are men. Men with superior training, information, and tactical support. The rest is mythos, perpetuated by their success. He stood and began to pace. Not thirty minutes ago he had been smiling and discussing the path to peace with Felicity Long. What a fool he'd been. She was the great Satan's ambassador, practiced in the art of deception. All her talk of cooperation was nothing but lies. Her words of support in front of the assembly, nothing but a diversion to buy America time to continue its attacks on Iran. Did she know about his son's murder? Is that why she had sought him out, to mock him to his face? Competing emotions, vengeful rage, and debilitating sorrow made it difficult for him to think clearly. He looked at Amir. Will you help me, brother? Help me to avenge my firstborn son's death. Amir looked down at his feet. After a painfully long pause, he said, I will not lie to you. Brother, a terrible mistake was made. By presidential order, we have been providing their American military commanders with leaked information, real information, in order to establish trust. Until now, we have only leaked intelligence pertaining to affiliate activities in Lebanon, Syria, the Arabian Peninsula, and North Africa. The Americans were supposed to be tipped off about a Libyan ship smuggling the last cache of chemical weapons out of Syria. There is great demand for sarin on the black market, especially now that Assad's stockpile has been extradited by the Russians. But one of my analysts mixed up the shipping manifests and mistakenly leaked information about our ship smuggling the Sayadu missiles. We did not learn about the error until after the seals hit the ship. My heart is broken to have to tell you this, Masood, but you deserve to know the truth. Instead of hot rage, an icy calm washed over Masood. Now Ambassador Long's National Security Council comments suddenly made sense. This was the cooperation she was alluding to, not Iran bowing to IAEA pressure for transparency in nuclear site inspections. Amir's secret program was what had grabbed the American president's attention. A terrible epiphany occurred to him as he put the second piece of the puzzle together. He felt light-headed and braced himself against a chair. So this program is responsible for my son's death? His brother shook his head softly. I know the pain of losing a son must be terrible, but we cannot put our personal need for revenge above the needs of our country and Islam. We cannot destroy the bridge of trust we have built with the Americans until the time is strategically right to do so. A mistake was made, but the mistake did not kill my son. The Americans did. Kamal's blood is on the hands of the Navy SEALs who assaulted the ship. We must avenge my son's death, Amir. Defang the serpent that you yourself said is the bane of your existence, Masood said, shaking his fist, and avenge Kamal's death. Amir rubbed his beard in silence for a very long time. Finally he spoke. I will only agree if we can devise a trap that has plausible deniability and keeps my source in play with the Americans. Masood nodded. The losses on their side must be commensurate with the losses on our side. That will be difficult and dangerous. It will require many martyrs, men of consequence and importance. Allah rewards the faithful and the brave. Amir stood, walked to Masood, and embraced him. 
I will try to do this thing you ask of me, my brother, Amir whispered. For Kamal and for Persia, added Masood. And for Allah, praise be his name. Chapter 4 607 Horseshoe Drive, Queens Lake Subdivision, Williamsburg, Virginia. October 12, 2320, local time. Kelso Jarvis looked at the phone vibrating face down on his desk and tried to remember if there had ever been a phone call after 2,200 hours bearing good news. He flipped the phone over and saw Smith's name on the screen. He took the call on the third ring. Jarvis, he said simply. Hey, boss, it's me on a secure line. What's up with our boy in the desert? He knew the call was about Dempsey, no point in wasting time. Dempsey went dark. His helo flight never arrived in Baghdad, and the pilot missed the last programmed check-in 40 minutes ago. What about the rest of the assault team? Return to the compound in Erbil on schedule. Jarvis pursed his lips and drilled a fingertip into his left temple. If Dempsey was discovered, or worse, captured, in ISIS-controlled Iraq, the ensuing firestorm would be one of biblical proportions. From the beginning, the Director of National Intelligence had been reluctant to approve any mission embedding Ember assets with the SEALs in Iraq. The President has publicly said we will not put boots on the ground in Iraq, Director Phillips had growled at Jarvis. And so as far as the President is concerned, there are no SEALs conducting combat operations in Iraq. The SEALs in Erbil are for the security of the diplomatic mission there. Any media reports to the contrary would discredit the administration. But the truth was Jarvis didn't give a shit about President Warner or the media. All that mattered was stomping out terrorism. Everything else was just noise. Unlike most of the spineless bureaucrats Phillips dealt with on a daily basis, Jarvis refused to be cowed. Eventually, he had been able to convince the DNI to greenlight the mission by offering unconditional assurance the operation would be completed in absolute secrecy. The promise was wind, of course. Jarvis could not guarantee absolute secrecy any more than a meteorologist could guarantee a forecast. However, he was not naive in this business. The only surefire way to keep his fledgling counterterrorism unit operational was to ensure Ember's activities did not sink his bosses. Smith's report could not have been graver. John Dempsey existed only under non-official cover. If captured by ISIS, his ransom, or public execution, fate forbid, would be the end of Ember. You still there, boss? Smith asked, snapping Jarvis back to the present. Yeah, sorry. Jarvis said. Did you try him on his secure sat? Yes, nothing. Baldwin is trying to triangulate a position, but the phone might be powered off or damaged. Shane, I think we need to consider the possibility Dempsey's helo crashed. That's exactly where my mind was going, Smith said, his voice rife with tension. Jarvis had watched Smith and Dempsey become close over the past six months, something both inevitable and unfortunate in this line of work. He understood Smith's angst all too well, but angst was a cognitive liability Jarvis couldn't afford to indulge. "'What's your plan, Opso?' he asked, trying to get Smith on point. "'I want to put the rest of special activities on a jet to Iraq and get Dempsey out.' Jarvis paused long enough for Smith to think he struggled with the decision. "'No, we have too much exposure on this already.' Work with your contacts at the base to task a drone to look for a downed helo and start planning a rescue mission with the SEAL team. I'll try to get you some satellite time to augment the search. Keep me apprised if Ian finds the phone. After a noteworthy pause came Smith's. Yes, sir. The formality flagged his disappointment. Jarvis slipped into the role of Tier 1 commander from his past. It was what Smith needed. He'll be all right, Shane he said with unbridled confidence. In case you've forgotten, Dempsey is a very hard man to kill. I'm sure you're right, Smith said, his voice reflecting back some of Jarvis's assuredness. 
Hell, what we really need to be worried about is Dempsey taking on ISIS all by himself. He's probably out there kicking ass and stacking jihadist bodies like cordwood. How am I going to explain that to the DNI? Smith laughed, then said, I'll call you with a sit rep in an hour, if not sooner. Roger that. Jarvis tossed the phone onto the desk and added a knuckle to his other temple. He closed his eyes and let his brain do what came naturally. Strategic options and variables began to take shape, organizing themselves into a decision tree with logic gates. Seconds later, he was sketching the details on a piece of paper, his hand flying over the page. As he drew, his mind assigned colors to the different lines, estimating probabilities based on his twenty years of experience planning and running Tier 1 missions. When he was finished, he had a roadmap to help guide Ember through this quagmire. Only one of the paths ended with Dempsey coming home safe with his knock intact. The other outcomes all required various degrees of damage control, and damage control was expensive. Not in a financial sense, but in a parasitic one. Anything that diverted his attention from his penultimate goal was expensive. Ember's original charter had been to find those responsible for massacring the Tier 1 SEALs in Yemen and take any and all action to make sure something like that never happened again. They had made those connections. They had found the mastermind of the attack, Vivac's director of operations, Amir Modiri. They had also identified the U.S. government official who had leaked information to the Iranians prior to the attack. But unlike Dempsey, who still desired vengeance, Jarvis's objectives were more pragmatic. He sought a reckoning, a rebalancing of power in the Middle East. Vivac and its expanding network of clandestine operatives was secretly and quietly wreaking havoc throughout the region. The new, moderate Iran was a chimera, an illusion designed to hide its growing dogmatic and militant aspirations. If he could unmask Iran's intentions to leverage the activity of terrorist groups like al-Qaeda and ISIS to aid its rise to global power, then the world would reassess. An Iran that facilitated terror operations was a very, very dangerous development. And so to truly fulfill his charter, he needed to penetrate Modiri's network, learn his allies and operations, and crush them. He sighed, blowing air through his teeth in a long, measured exhale. A balloon deflating. At times like this, he wished he had a kindred soul he could talk to an equal to strategize with, parlay ideas, and vet his logic. He glanced at his phone and considered calling Levi Harrell. The legendary former Mossad director was the closest thing to a friend Jarvis had in this mad world. They had not spoken in months, not since Harrell had helped him track down one of Modiri's field operatives in Frankfurt. Without the Mossad's help, Ember would have never been able to foil Modiri's brilliant terror plot at the United Nations. In gratitude, Jarvis had promised to reciprocate any time, no matter the cost, no matter the risk. Harrell had yet to call in the favor. He picked up the secure phone, scrolled through the contact list, and stared at Harrell's number. After a long pause, he changed his mind. He knew exactly what he needed to do. No affirmation was required. He went back to his paper and worked on his damage control plans for each of the possible outcomes of Dempsey missing in Iraq. When the next call came in from Smith, he would be ready to make decisions and give orders without delay. Then, and only then, would he call the DNI.
Reggie? Buckingham did a quick scan of his own and nodded. Yes, sir. Why is no one from Langley here? Well, it's late, but we've been dialoguing with them from the beginning, Buckingham said and folded his arms across his chest. I realize this meeting doesn't feel interagency, but I assure you we're talking to all the right people. Amanda Allen is CIA, Jarvis said. Everyone here knows that, right? He got nods back from around the table, but no comments. Who's looking for her on the ground? he asked. Langley is on it, Buckingham said. Ground Branch is looking for her. That's not good enough, Jarvis said, both annoyed and flabbergasted. Whoever took Allen is going to move her out of country. It might have happened already. This needs to be a coordinated effort so we can bring all the resources of the intelligence community to bear. Agreed, Buckingham said. Then, after an uncomfortable beat and an obvious effort not to look at Catherine Morgan, but to be completely honest, sir, we wanted to see which direction you wanted to take things. My predecessor was let go for overstepping his bounds. Given the highly political and sensitive nature of this event, we weren't sure if you wanted CIA or DIA to take the lead? Or maybe you'd prefer to task that black vapor task force of yours? NCTC has stepped on all kinds of toes the past couple of years, and I don't want to keep making the same mistakes. Jarvis resisted the urge to scowl. He resisted the urge to sigh, to curse, to condemn, or to use sarcasm. Reggie Buckingham had just been brazenly honest with him and highlighted the exact reason Jarvis had started Ember in the first place. Institutional paralysis perpetuated by bullshit rice bowl mentalities and supersized bureaucrat egos. The oblique reference to his predecessor's firing by Catherine Morgan during her short tenure as acting DNI was not lost on Jarvis either. That single act of perceived retribution against his predecessor for protecting Ember had left a mark on Buckingham's psyche. It was astonishing to Jarvis that the director of the NCTC, one of the top posts in the counterterrorism community, had chosen to handcuff himself rather than face professional admonishment. In his peripheral vision, Jarvis noted Catherine's jaw set in hard, silent discord. Your predecessor was put in an impossible situation, Reggie, Jarvis said calmly. I'm going to try not to do that with you. Buckingham nodded, but offered no other reply. All right, folks, let's take a ten-minute break. Jarvis said, pulling out his handkerchief to wipe his runny nose. Then turning to Buckingham, he quietly added, Reggie, why don't you give CIA Director Barrett a call at home, tell him that the DNI was disappointed that neither he nor any of his deputies were in attendance at this meeting? Yes, sir, Buckingham said, nodding and red-faced. And ask your people to give me, Petra, and Catherine the room for a few minutes. Roger that, the NCTC director said and turned to make it happen. When the room was theirs, Jarvis exhaled loudly and looked back and forth between the two women he considered to be the brightest and most capable people on his staff, his gaze ultimately settling on Catherine. What's our exposure with Alan? She's green, Morgan said, not missing a beat. She's only been in the position four months. From what I can gather, she's smart, and early feedback was positive. Clandestine services had high hopes for her. She's read into most of our operations in the region. How big is her stable of collection assets? Pretty big. Her predecessor was Mike Hughes. Do you know Mike? No, Jarvis said. Well, he left behind some big shoes to fill. Mike was very aggressive in Turkey, spending most of his tenure developing assets. If she was a hard study and committed her network to memory, it could be a problem for us if they break her. That's assuming her cover was blown and she was the target of the operation, Petra interjected. I find that scenario unlikely. So you think she was a target of opportunity? Morgan asked. Not even. I think she was an acquisition of opportunity, said Petra. A spur-of-the-moment decision. There's been no ransom demand yet. Do we think the assholes that took her know who her father is? Jarvis said. 
The story broke. It's all over the news. If they didn't know before, they most certainly do now, Petrus said. Has the Chief Justice made a statement yet? He asked. No, said Petra and Catherine in unison. He nodded. Good. I want to be in control of the narrative. Petra, can you reach out to Justice Allen and set up a meeting with him tomorrow? Uh, I mean, this morning? We also need to get someone from the Joint Hostage Recovery Task Force in the loop here. Make sure it's someone good. Understood. We'll do, Petra said. Regardless of the optics, we have to get Allen back. Whoever did this murdered the U.S. ambassador in broad daylight in downtown Ankara. They're obviously intent on making a very loud statement on the global stage, and I'll be damned if I let them execute Alan on YouTube, Jarvis growled. It's just us now, so I want your unfiltered opinions. Who do you think took her? My money is on TAK, Morgan said. They have been the most active terrorist group in Turkey over the past five years, and their M.O. is bombing police and civilian targets in major cities. Just a month ago, they released a statement reiterating that, and I quote, all the cities of Turkey are our battlegrounds, and that their actions will be more intense than in the past. They've also stated that the recent Turkish offensives in Syria against Kurdish settlements would not go unpunished. Jarvis nodded, then looked to Petra. My money is on PKK, she said. Why? They have the most resources, and they have an active intelligence collection apparatus inside Turkey. Despite publicly renouncing the use of terrorist tactics, I think they're escalating. And that's not to say this attack wasn't executed by TAK or one of the other factions, but I believe PKK is driving this bus. The common thread I'm hearing from both of you is escalation. Eridan is going after the Kurds. No ifs, ands, or buts about it, and the Kurds are fighting back. Still, how TAK or PKK could pull off an attack like this is... perplexing to me. Jarvis rubbed his temples. It would have required dedicated advance ISR with spotter teams and assets running interference. Maybe PKK has evolved to that level of sophistication. I don't know, but we can worry about the how later, right now. We need to focus on two things. One, finding and rescuing Alan, and two, figuring out who is responsible and what they're planning next. Because mark my words, something else is coming. I can feel it. Agreed, Petra said. So we have a decision to make. Do we let CIA manage Alan's recovery effort? Do we take over and put together a joint task force? Or do we simply use Ember? Tasking Ember was the most expedient solution. It was the easy answer to a difficult problem. But that didn't make it the right answer. Jarvis sighed with frustration. Honestly, my immediate inclination is to pick up the phone and conference Shane Smith into this meeting right now. But, but, to ignore the systemic dysfunction we're witnessing between CIA, DIA, NCTC, and state would be a failure of leadership. A failure of our leadership, Morgan said. He met her gaze. Was this the new Catherine Morgan talking, or the old one? He knew how she felt about Ember. This was the very woman who one year ago had informed him that her first act, were she confirmed as permanent DNI, would be to disband America's premier black ops task force. In an ironic twist of fate, the president had appointed Jarvis as DNI, not Morgan. Instead of firing her, Jarvis had made her his deputy director of intelligence integration. Since she'd been the one complaining most loudly about silo operations and compartmentalized activities within the IC, he decided to put her in charge of implementing policies and structures to address interagency dysfunction. Thus far, she'd made very little progress. Now wasn't the time to rebuke her, so he simply said, You are correct in saying that a failure to try to bring order and improvement to the current system would be a failure in leadership, but leadership is also about recognizing the difference between emergency surgery and rehabilitation. This is emergency surgery, and Ember is our crash team on standby. I'm sorry, but we don't have a choice. I'm tasking Ember. He slipped his hand into his pocket, 
retrieved his mobile phone, and sent a secure SMS to Shane Smith. Where is Ember Sad right now? The response came almost instantly. Croatia, they just nabbed Alpha Kuri and rescued two hostages. Good. Have you heard about Turkey? Yes. Do you have tasking for us? Wrap up, head to Inserlik, and find Amanda Allen. Roger. We'll send you all the intel we have, but you have authority to requisition whatever resources you need. Roger that. Standing by. Jarvis set his phone on the conference table and looked from Petra to Catherine and back again. It was the right call to make, Petra said with a nod. I know, he said as a grim foreboding washed over him. But for Amanda Allen's sake, I just hope we're not too late. Chapter 5 Ember Van Westbound on Königin Luise Strasse Berlin, Germany, 1850, local time. No matter how many layers of filthy clothing he removed, Dempsey still smelled like shit. Not the manly stench of protracted combat, sweat, dirt, and testosterone, no. He was an homage to excrement. Urine, vomit, and shit. He'd made sure all the orifices were represented, electing to piss and puke himself in the field to complete the look of a homeless drunk. And it had worked. When it came to role-playing, authenticity was key. Coming up on the embassy in just a moment, Buzz said from the driver's seat. Beside him, as he stripped naked, Grimes stared absently out the window at the passing gray buildings. He held his breath as he pulled the final layer of stench-laden clothes off his body, shoved them into a garbage bag, and sealed it. The smell in the truck improved immediately, but it would probably take antiseptic soap and a fire hose shower to make him palatable. Grimes bent over the backpack at her feet, retrieved a sweatsuit top and bottoms, and handed it to him. Thanks, he said. Sorry about the smell. No problem, was all she said as she looked back out the window. See, this is why I need mun, he thought as he pulled on the sweatpants. I'm sitting here buck naked and filthy, and she doesn't even take the once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to bust my balls and get back at me for earlier today. Munn was an operator, a former SEAL like Dempsey, and as a SEAL, Munn knew how to be a proper wingman. Dempsey didn't want a no problem from Grimes. He needed someone to give him shit about the smell. He needed someone to comment on his appearance and call him a fucking stinky hobo when he was decked out like a stinky hobo, then compliment him for smelling better than usual after an op. But Grimes was locked up so tight. The only actual banter they'd shared for months was this morning when he'd caught her naked, and he certainly couldn't rely on that to happen every time he wanted to talk smack with her. You okay? he asked, looking at her. She shrugged, but then seemed to think better of it and turned on him. Do you have to say that Every time, she asked through clenched teeth. What? he asked, feeling heat in his face. I'm not allowed to ask if you're okay now? No, not that, John, she said with exasperation. I mean, dear God, do you have to call out De Oppresso Liber every time you kill one of them? Want to just wear a T-shirt with an American flag and sing the national anthem while you pull the trigger? It's for Shane he said softly, barely biting back anger that didn't really make any sense. Shane was a Green Beret, damn it. And in the moment before I end each and every one of those Russian bastards, I want them to understand. I want them to understand who is killing them and why. And so to answer your question, yes, I'm going to call out De Oppresso Liber every time, because I want it to be the last fucking thing every Zeta hears before they die. Yeah, well, it's a gut punch for me every time you do it. And second, it compromises the mission. Who knows who might be listening? Wang's not perfect. Yes, I am, Wang said on the Still Active Comms channel, but instead of his usual swagger, his voice was flat and monotone. No, you're not, she said, which means every time J.D. satisfies his neurotic compulsion, he risks blowing our knocks. 
What do you think our allies will do when they all start comparing notes and figure out there's an American assassin on a killing spree across Europe who recites the U.S. Army Special Forces motto before he murders his victims? Dempsey shrugged but said nothing. She was right, of course, but he simply couldn't make himself care. I hold you a half block from the Clay Alley Gate, Wang said, also choosing not to continue the debate. Since the attack just months ago on Ember's talk and the deaths of Smith, Adamo, and Latif, not to mention the crippling spine injury to Chris Noble, a.k.a. Dale, Wang had been morose and depressed. No jokes, no bravado, none of the tech genius pointing out how flawless his ISR, intelligence surveillance reconnaissance, was on a daily basis. Dempsey was worried about Wang, maybe the most of anyone on the team. Even Ember's relocation to Tampa, a town with plenty of attractive girls and a hopping nightlife, had done little to buoy Wang's spirits. On the flip side, the kid's operational performance had gone to the next level. He was faster and more precise, and without all the self-aggrandizing commentary, he'd begun to make tactical observations and strategic contributions during ops. Yet, despite all that, Dempsey missed the kid's irritating babble, just like he missed having Munn as his smack-talking wingman. And I miss Smith playing Mother Hen and Latif picking on Martin and Adamo talking about cold facts, whatever the hell those are, while incessantly pushing his stupid glasses up on his nose. When Zeta hit us at home, we lost more than just a building in our brothers. We lost our soul. Dempsey shook off thoughts of lost souls. He was an operator, a weapon, an instrument of policy. At the moment, that policy was to exact retribution on Spetsgruppe Zeta and every one of its operators they could find. And when that was done, they would find and eliminate Russia's legendary spymaster, Arkady Zhukov, too. Buzz braked. Why are we stopping? Dempsey asked, looking up. So the Marines can open the gate, Buzz said. Why are the gates closed? Grimes asked. They close them whenever there's an op underway in the city, Buzz said and quickly held up a hand before Grimes could speak. And yes, I am aware that they might as well run a flag up the embassy flagpole saying American covert operation in progress, but we're guests here, I assure you. CIA has bitched about it for years. Marine Corps security dictates policy for the embassy and... Gates closed during operations in Berlin is that policy. Someone should tell them keeping operations covert is way better security than an eight-foot-high iron gate, Grimes mumbled. Buzz looked like he might say something, but simply nodded instead. With a wave from the Marine Guard, the former CIA man and Russian operations expert piloted them through the gate and across the wide courtyard nestled behind the main building. The square stone building they headed to was officially the United States Trade and Investment Bureau mission, but anyone who knew anything about the history of Berlin knew this was the nerve center for CIA operations in the city, a city once surrounded by a stone wall and ground zero for covert operations during the Cold War. Buzz had been here then, Dempsey knew and he watched the spook purse his lips under his magnum P.I. mustache as he parked tight to the building and shut off the engine. Something was clearly eating at Buzz, but the old-timer always kept his thoughts to himself. Dempsey climbed out of the vehicle, tossed the trash bag full of soiled clothes into a dumpster beside the access ramp at the back of the building and fell in behind Grimes. Buzz pressed the door buzzer, waved his hand in front of the camera, and a second later the door clicked open. The trio walked to a borrowed conference room they were using for an ops center, and Dempsey collapsed into a leather task chair. Grimes selected a chair across the table from him, the smell, he assumed, and Buzz took a seat at the head where a closed laptop waited. He opened the screen, logged in, and brought up a video feed on the wall-mounted monitor. Baldwin's face filled the screen just as Wang walked in. The cyber whiz gave a somber nod to Dempsey, who returned a thumbs up. "'Everyone all right?' Baldwin asked. Dempsey sensed his concern was genuine, but his demeanor lacked the academic enthusiasm that had always been his hallmark. 
The Zeta attack on Ember had affected Baldwin, too. Dale, now a paraplegic, had been one of his protégés. Baldwin had hardened in the aftermath. Maybe embittered was a better word, Dempsey thought, staring at the screen. Jesus, J.D., you look like shit, Munn's familiar voice said as the doc entered the frame. Or, I should say, you look like you smell like shit. Is it even worse than in Thailand that one time? Dempsey smiled and felt himself relax. Thank God for Munn. Not quite that bad, bro, he chuckled, trying to capture the camaraderie from a memory that felt like a lifetime ago. What's this make? Munn said. Three in a row you managed to complete without me? I guess miracles do happen. Grimes crossed her arms against her chest. Getting back to business? We're all fine, and the operational objective was achieved. No reaction from local law enforcement, and we believe our knocks are intact, she said while giving Dempsey the stink eye. That's okay, sis. You're allowed. Any collateral problems? Things you would have done differently? Mon asked. No sheep were harmed on this op, Dempsey said, suppressing a grin, if that's what you're asking. Yes, good. As you know, livestock welfare is always my primary concern, Mun said. The park was mostly empty. Wang disabled area security cameras, but in any case, we could not ID any surveillance in the vicinity of the hit, something I suspect Habicht knew. He lured me there just like we predicted, Grimes said. Yes, which is why we should always take advantage of ISR conducted by a target in advance, Baldwin said. We must strive to work smarter, not harder. Right, Dempsey grumbled, and then looking at Baldwin in his suit coat and tie, wondered why the hell Jarvis had put a man who, despite his brilliance, had no special operations experience or qualifications in charge of Task Force Ember. But then again, if not Baldwin, who? Baldwin had been with Jarvis and Smith from the beginning, and other than Dempsey, nobody else had the clearance and organizational experience to assume the role on short notice. Okay, well, if there's no additional constructive input, Baldwin said, let's move on to preparations for the next mission. Hold on, Dempsey said, raising a hand. As much as it gives me great pleasure to end these fuckers, I'd like to open the door to revisiting the operational strategy. We've now capped a half dozen Zetas, and we're still no closer to cutting the head off the snake than when we started. I appreciate the work that Alan is doing, harvesting names from Besinov, and every Zeta we take out weakens the organization. But when are we going to start focusing on Zhukov? Kill Arkady Zhukov and all these other assholes wither on the vine. We tried that with the first target, remember? Grimes said before Baldwin or Munn could respond. She was looking across the table at him. And it was a colossal waste of time. The Zeta field operators are completely compartmentalized. They're read into their knocks and the details of their specific operations. We could interrogate them for months or years and never harvest any actionable intelligence beyond the training pipeline in Vyborg. And that's provided we could break them at all. Besinov is different. She was support. She ran C4 and accumulated personnel and operational knowledge during her tenure. If you want Zhukov, then she's key. Break her and you find him. Alan is convinced Besinov is already broken, Baldwin said. Okay, Grimes shrugged. I'm not, but you've made your position crystal clear on enhanced interrogation, Ian, so here we are. Dempsey felt a surge of anger, but he wasn't sure why. He wasn't even sure he disagreed with her. Maybe it was a programmed reaction because Grimes was behaving like the know-it-all firebrand she'd been during the early days when they both joined Ember. He pushed back from the table, got up from his chair, and began to pace. Look, I guess the point I'm making is that I'm sick of playing whack-a-mole. I want to find Arkady Zhukov, and I want this to be over. As do we all, John, Baldwin said in a tone Dempsey usually found so patronizing that it chapped his ass. For some reason today, however, he found it strangely endearing. But the hope has always been that if we hit enough Zeta assets, then Zhukov will be forced to adjust his strategy. 
How many losses can he tolerate without action? How many assets must he lose before he changes tack, breaks protocol, or calls them in from the cold? Rest assured, with each prosecution we're collecting signals intelligence. We are aggregating, analyzing, and trying to correlate thousands of data points about his network of operatives. At some point, we will have a breakthrough. Intel that leads us to him or predicts his next move. Eventually, Zhukov will make a mistake, and then we will get him. And until that happens, the world is a better place without each and every one of these assholes we eliminate, Mun added. We don't know what Petrov and Zhukov are going to cook up as their next big false flag operation. What is the next ship they plan to sink and call it an industrial accident? What is the next strategic facility they plan to attack and call it terrorism? Every Zeta we kill is like taking out a mid-level officer in charge of a squadron of assets. I don't know what the dude you just whacked in the park was planning, but I do know that eliminating him made Berlin a safer place. The same is true for London, Helsinki, Bangkok, and Bucharest. God only knows what Russian operations we thwarted in those cities. Don't get me wrong, Dempsey said. He stopped pacing and leaned against the high-back leather chair he'd been sitting in. I thoroughly enjoy ending these bastards, more than you know, maybe. And you're right, every field operative we take out is sand in the gears for Zhukov's mayhem machine, but once they're gone, I'm worried that the trail will go cold. The thought of Zhukov disappearing into the night? He sighed. I get it, J.D., Munn said, but I think we all need to trust the process. Look at you playing peacemaker, Dempsey thought. I gotta get you back in the field with me before it's too late. Do we have the next target? Grimes said in her let's get on with it voice. Baldwin and Munn nodded in unison and disappeared from the screen. In their place, a headshot appeared of a woman who looked thirty-five, but Dempsey decided could be older depending on her level of fitness. She was smiling in the photo, a genuine and happy smile, the smile of someone living their best life. She looked like a business executive or perhaps an attorney, but certainly not a killer. And therein lay the con, because that was exactly what she was. This is Selina Pichler, Baldwin began. According to her CV, she's a 35-year-old French pharmaceutical executive, and she is our next Zeta target.
said, set up shop. The atmosphere in here was completely different from the kitchen, the word raucous coming to mind, but the good kind of raucous. It was immediately evident to Jarvis that the Israeli contingent in attendance was a tight, collegial group, and with the Prime Minister dining with the President at the White House tonight, they were partying like kids without parental supervision. No surprise, Sharot was in the middle of the crowd drinking red wine and in the company of three women. Two of the women Jarvis did not recognize, but the third he knew, Catherine Morgan, the principal deputy DNI. Jarvis felt her gaze on him, and he chose not to make eye contact with her. Director Phillips, Sharot called as they approached. This is a wonderful party, but we have a small problem. What's that, Rami? The sunroom is too small. We have too many Jews and not enough space, he said. We've decided we're going to expand our settlement to the west. That wall over there is going to have to go. This garnered a round of laughter, and even the DNI couldn't help but chuckle at the double entendre. I'll have to bring your proposal to my governance council, Philip said, glancing over his shoulder at his wife, who had stopped to talk with one of Sherrod's deputies. Her vote will determine whether the resolution passes. A second round of laughter ensued, and Jarvis sighed inaudibly with relief. This good-natured, friendly banter mattered. It meant that Phillips and Sherrod had established a cooperative and friendly working relationship during the year since Phillips had taken the reins as the DNI. As far as Jarvis was concerned, Israel was America's most important and strategic ally in the world, and continued cooperation with their clandestine service was essential to staying one step ahead of Tehran, ISIS, Al-Qaeda, Hamas, Hezbollah, Boko Haram, and every other radical faction with aspirations of building the next Islamic caliphate and sowing seeds of fear, instability, and violence in the West. Yet, with all the damage that had been done to the West, it nowhere near approached the damage the extremists had meted out on peace-loving Muslims worldwide. The extremists had killed more Muslims than any other group. Rami, Phillips said, stealing the beat, I'd like to introduce you to a good friend of mine, Captain Kelso Jarvis. Captain Jarvis retired from the SEALs, and now he works in the private sector as one of our key security contractors. Charlotte smiled broadly and extended a hand to Jarvis. A pleasure to meet you, Captain Jarvis. Any friend of Director Phillips is a friend of mine. The honor is all mine, General, Jarvis said, shaking hands with Charlotte, noting the other man's rock-solid grip. His own grip, however, seemed to falter during the exchange from a sudden flare of weakness in his fingers. He resisted the urge to frown at this, keeping his smile up and genuine. I had the privilege of working with the 269 during several occasions when I was downrange. In fact, I had the great honor of serving as an exchange officer with Shy Tet 13 earlier in my career, and learned more than I can say. Sherrod's gaze sharpened and he looked at Jarvis with a shared appreciation. I am sure they learned much from you as well. Maybe, Jarvis said, but I can tell you I have great respect for both S-13 and the 269. Earlier in the Iraq war, we worked very closely together. Hell, I might not be standing here if it wasn't for you and your brothers. The left corner of Sherrod's mouth curled up. You are referring to 2003? That's the one. I heard stories, Sherrod said. Wish I could have been there. No, you don't, Jarvis said, and both men laughed. I'd be interested in learning more about the company you work for, Sherrod said. Contract security operations, is it? Jarvis nodded. I have a small team, but we stay busy. No doubt. I'm not sure if Director Phillips has told you, but the Mossad sometimes utilizes the services of private contractors. There is a small Israeli security company that does work for us from time to time. Maybe there could be some synergies all around. I could put you in touch with their director, if you're interested. Thank you. I would like that, Jarvis said, studying the Mossad chief's face for information beyond the words. He would confirm his conclusion with the DNI later, but this exchange seemed to indicate that Sherat did not know about Ember, nor did he know about Jarvis's history, with Harrell. Excellent. When can you come to Tel Aviv? 
Sherrod said. Hey, 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 don't think I don't see where this is going, the DNI interjected. I invite you to D.C., throw you a party at my house, open a case of wine from my private collection, and you're already trying to steal my talent. Never, Sherrod said with a sly chuckle. Don't worry, Director Phillips, Catherine Morgan said, slipping her arm inside Jarvis's elbow to link arms. I'll keep him on a tight leash. Jarvis turned to her, meeting her gaze for the first time since joining the circle. She was staging a little coup, extracting him from the budding conversation at the worst possible time. See that you do, Phillips said. If you'll please excuse us, she said, shifting her attention to Sherrod. I have a few pressing matters to discuss with Captain Jarvis. Of course, the Mossad chief said with a nod. It was an honor to meet you, Kelso. I look forward to continuing our dialogue in the future. The honor is all mine, sir. Morgan escorted him wordlessly out of the sunroom. When they reached a door leading to the backyard, she released his arm and gestured for him to step outside. The hair on the back of his neck bristled, but he complied. Outside, the aroma of barbecue hit him once again, making his mouth instantly salivate. But he knew better than to think she'd led him here to lay claim to a slab of ribs on the grill. Did I say something wrong? he asked, knowing full well he had not. No, she said, shaking her feathered silver bangs at him. But I didn't want Ed to give Rami the wrong impression about you. And what impression is that? he asked, silently noting how she referred to the two most powerful men in the global clandestine war on terror by their first names. The impression that you and your organization are important, she said without a hint of humor. Multiple acerbic retorts to this unprompted slap to the face populated his mind, but he simply said, Excuse me, walk with me, she replied, and set off across the lawn toward the swimming pool. Of all the troubling reports that filter across my desk, she continued, her voice oozing with bureaucratic superiority, the ones that trouble me most always seem to concern the activities of a particular entity operating right in our own backyard down in Newport News. Resisting the urge to roll his eyes at the hyperbole, he simply said, Oh, really? I would have thought as the principal deputy director you would find the reports concerning terrorist activity aimed at slaughtering Americans the most troubling— not my little group, which devotes all of its resources to counter-terrorism operations. You might think that, but you'd be wrong, she said, stepping off the lawn onto the wide concrete pool deck. Would you like to know why that is, Kelso? Yes, Catherine, he said, matching her tone. I'm dying to know. There is a multi-billion dollar apparatus powered by thousands of highly skilled people using highly developed technology and carefully harvested human intelligence to prosecute the terrorist threat. And all of that activity is reported to and managed by us. All activity, that is, except for yours. I'm sure you are aware that my organization is tasked directly by the DNI, Jarvis said, his eyes narrowing. Perhaps, Morgan said, but he allows you an unprecedented and, in my opinion, dangerous degree of autonomy. Jarvis felt anger rising and swallowed it down. His lips curled into a wry smile. You yanked me out of a conversation with the Mossad chief and the DNI, your boss, to talk about oversight? Her face hardened. Yes, Captain, I did. And it does not appear you appreciate the gravity of the situation. With all due respect, I understand the gravity of the situation all too well. The multi-billion dollar intelligence and clandestine apparatus you're touting is the reason that Ember exists. The old expression, necessity is the mother of invention, applies in this case. Ember was born from necessity, and we— He stopped mid-sentence, his gaze fixed on the back of the house. What is it? she asked, turning to see where his attention had relocated. Why is that vehicle backed up to the house? he asked, eyeing a catering van that was parked right next to the back patio, a mere ten feet from the kitchen. That's the caterers. It's a full-on mobile kitchen. They even have a grill inside, she answered. 
Apparently it's the newest catering meme, keep the caterers and the mess out of the kitchen so the guests can mingle there. If you've ever thrown a party, you know that everyone gravitates to the kitchen whether you want them in there or not. Why fight the inevitable? His pulse picked up. Yeah, but that vehicle is violating the safety setback. Just like out front, all vehicles should be parked outside a fifty-foot radius of the house. Every vehicle was inspected at the gate, she replied. I don't care. It shouldn't be there, he huffed. If you'll excuse me, Catherine, we can continue our conversation after I get it moved. He turned his back on her, not giving her an opportunity to rebut and set off toward the house. He only managed two strides before the explosion drove him backward. Muscle memory took over. He spun in midair and dove on top of the deputy DNI, shielding her body with his as a fireball four stories high engulfed the house. Pieces of slate roof tile, glass shards, and chunks of wood and brick rained down over a four hundred foot radius, pelting him on his back and legs. Jarvis absorbed the shock and the pain with the expertise from years in the field and far too many explosions. He kept his chin tucked, protecting his head as best he could, the only body part that could not recover from a direct blow from a brick. He felt something heavy hit him in the back of the right thigh with the impact of a sledgehammer, and he raised his shoulders beside his head even more. Finally, he felt only the pelting of the smaller particles, and then only dust. He rolled off the woman beneath him. Are you okay, ma'am? he said, the seal in him now in complete control. I think so, she said, wiping her right cheek and then inspecting the blood smear on her fingertips. It's just a scratch, he said. He quickly inspected her head, neck, and torso for any legitimate impalements. Finding none, he said, Do you see that grove of trees over there? She followed his eyes to a stand of birch trees behind the pool house. Yes, she said, her voice quavering on the brink of panic. The deputy DNI was not a former field agent, and he guessed this was much closer than she had ever come to dying before. But despite surviving the blast, they weren't safe yet. In theater, explosions were inevitably followed by sniper fire. Relocating her to safe cover was imperative. Go there, stay low, and get small, he said, pulling the Sig Sauer 226 from the holster at the small of his back. I'll come back for you. Where are you going? she asked, wiping her face again and looking at the back of her hand. This might not be over, he said. Okay, she said. Then, struggling for control, she swallowed hard and closed her eyes tightly for a beat. When she reopened them, her face became stone. But first I'm going to call this in. Do it, he said, scanning around them over his Sig Sauer. Three hundred feet away, what had been Jackie Phillips's one hundred-year-old family estate was now a raging inferno. The devastation was simply tremendous. There would be few, if any, survivors. Was this terror? or was it a hit? He retrieved a wireless earbud from a pocket inside his suit coat and pressed it into his right ear canal. The earbud automatically synced with the mobile phone in his pocket. He tapped the end of the earbud three times, a preset that triggered the phone to dial the Tactical Operations Center at the Ember Hangar in Newport News, Virginia. In a low crouch, he moved in an arc around the rear perimeter of the house, first scanning the grounds between the pool house and the main house, and then surveying the property's southwestern-facing shoreline. The call connected. Zero, how's the party, sir? The voice in his ear belonged to Ian Baldwin, Ember's signals guru and head of data analytics. The DNI's house just got nuked. From the looks of things, no one inside survived. Mobilize everyone, get eyes on my location, and scan for comms. Yes, sir, Baldwin answered. But first I have to inquire, are you injured? No, don't worry about me, just find me a trail to follow. Roger that. I'll try to hijack some time on the satellite. Maybe I can task a drone. And, of course, we'll start looking at cellular traffic. Who am I looking for, exactly? Just do it, Ian, he barked. Baldwin, as usual, was just thinking out loud. Jarvis moved toward the east end of the house. If the attack had been perpetrated by operators, rather than martyrs, then a water egress across the bay to the adjacent peninsula was tactically superior for their getaway. Sirens wailed in the distance as Jarvis scanned over his weapon left and right, moving toward the tree line in a low tactical crouch. He entered the woods, wishing for both younger eyes and night vision goggles. The sliver of moonlight and the glow from the raging fire were stolen by the foliage around him. His body was a weapon now, 
all thoughts of aging and aches and pains a distant memory, as the seal that would never die inside him took over. He moved quickly but quietly through the woods, acutely cognizant of the terrain and each footfall. He glimpsed movement ahead, a shadow skirting along the shoreline. He squeezed both eyes shut to sharpen his night accommodation and then looked again. He tightened his grip on his weapon and trained the muzzle toward what looked like a hunched figure on the beach. Before squeezing the trigger, he needed to be sure he wasn't stalking a roving security guard who, like him, was searching for attackers. He didn't dare call out and forfeit his tactical advantage, which meant he needed visual confirmation. The low rumble of a gasoline engine, barely audible, pricked his ears. He pivoted left toward the sound and scanned the dark waters of the Chesapeake to the horizon. Twenty-five meters offshore, a small wake bubbled white in the moonlight. A rib, his mind told him, from the way it displaced the water, and it was moving toward the shore. This had to be the pickup team the ex-fill for the attacker or attackers. He tapped his earpiece again, his voice a soft whisper. Zero. We have a watercraft approaching the east end of the property. Get eyes on it now. Working on it, sir, came Baldwin's response. Where was the fucking perimeter security team? Was this the water patrol? Surely the DNI's protection detail had arranged for that. Jarvis advanced, growing more and more convinced with each passing second that these were not the good guys. His mind drew the approach vector for where the rib would intersect the shore, and he shifted his gaze there. A cloud drifted in front of the moon. He squinted and scanned the beach, having lost the hunched figure in the darkness. He held, statue still, and waited. The sky began to brighten. Movement on the shoreline. He squeezed the trigger. A figure stumbled, but didn't fall. It turned, and then a muzzle flash lit up the night, wrecking his night vision. Reflexively, Jarvis juked right, and a bullet that had been on a trajectory to hit him square in the face whizzed past his ear. He ducked, took cover behind a stump, squeezed his eyes tight for a three-count to restore his night vision, and then scanned the beach. The shadow was on the move, heading toward the rib. Jarvis shifted to one knee and fired five rounds, but none hit their mark as the shadow rolled into the rib. Cursing, Jarvis popped to his feet and sprinted through the trees, darting and dodging low-hanging branches and tree roots. By the time he reached the water's edge, the rib was screaming away. He skidded to a stop, took a bent knee firing position, and emptied his magazine, firing at the craft as it sped away, spraying a rooster tail and leaving white wake trailing behind. He swapped magazines and sent another volley of rounds into the night, powerless to do anything else but watch as the boat sped away into the black. Zero, where the hell are my eyes? he demanded. I'm coming up real time on the satellite now and have a drone en route. Ping on me. Just another forty five seconds, Baldwin said softly, a professor speaking to his class. Hurry, they're getting away. We'll get them. Jarvis could no longer see the rib or its wake. A beat later, the night went quiet. Clutching his pistol, he contemplated the attack clean, fast, efficient. This was no half-baked, homegrown terrorist event. "'What's taking so long?' Jarvis barked, staring out into the night. "'Coming up now,' Baldwin said in his ear. "'Their escape vector was north-northeast from my position. I'm looking... I don't see a boat. Is it possible that they—' "'Fuck!' Jarvis seethed, cutting Baldwin off. Look across the inlet. Scan the shoreline. It's a short hop by water, but a long haul by car. These guys were professionals, Ian, which means they would have planned for satellite and drone coverage. If this was my op, I'd ditch the boat, egress on foot under tree cover to a vehicle, and then get lost in Annapolis or D.C. Copy that, sir. We'll keep looking. Spin up the team and get them heading north. Yes, sir. And Baldwin, he said as a color-coded probability matrix began to take shape on the whiteboard in his mind. Sir? This feels like a false flag terrorist attack. It was too well planned and executed to be ISIS or some other extremist terror outfit. Work with our friends at Fort Meade and start mining facial recognition for all known VVAC assets and contractors. Low threshold, 51% match or better. Already in progress, came Baldwin's reply. This has Modiri's signature all over it, Jarvis said, talking more to himself than Baldwin now. VVAC is here and we're going to find them. Roger that, sir. 
I'm going back to the house to look for survivors. Update me immediately with any new information. Copy. Zero out. Jarvis checked his watch. More than eight minutes had passed since the explosion, and now three minutes since the rib had escaped. But there was still time. Whoever the attackers were, they were good, but he had something they didn't. He had John Dempsey. Chapter 5 1650 Tysons Boulevard, McLean, Virginia, June 11th, 0432 local time. The nightmare was a horror show, the sum of all his fears. Kelso, wake up, Petra said, rousing him. Breathe, Kelso, breathe. Where am I? Jarvis gasped, trying to clear his throat. You're at home, in bed, you're safe, she whispered. Try to breathe, it's just a dream. He found her hand on his chest and clasped his palm against the back of hers. Even through her hand, he could feel his heart pounding like a war drum. He tried to sit up and felt a stab of pain in his chest from the still-healing bullet wound he'd received in Istanbul only a month ago, when he and the president had been the targets of an assassination attempt. He had never been prone to nightmares. Not as a young SEAL officer, not as the CSO of the Tier 1, not even as director of Task Force Ember. Only now, as the director of national intelligence, years removed from the thick of action and violence, did the nightmares come. But these nightmares were not the product of his warrior past. They were not sins relived. The dreams that haunted his nights were twisted things, born from a different kind of fear, a malignancy growing inside him that no matter how hard he tried, he could not purge. Ow, he said, settling back down, the pain clearing away the fog of sleep and disorientation from the nightmare. He turned and found her eyes in the dark. Do you want to talk about it? She asked, her head and torso propped up by a wedge of three pillows beside him. No, he grumbled. And... Yes. She didn't say anything else, just gave his left pectoral muscle a gentle little whenever-you're-ready squeeze. I was in the White House... He began, turning away from her to look up at the ceiling. In the Oval Office, in fact, waiting to brief the president. The whole gang was there, Sec Def, the Vice President, Secretary of State Barnes, the National Security Advisor, and so on. And then I realized that they're all looking at me, waiting for me to say something. I look around, and they all have this terrible, worried look on their faces. Only then do I realize that I'm the one sitting at the resolute desk. Then Catherine Morgan steps up. Mr. President, can you hear me? She says, waving her hand in front of my face. Mr. President, are you okay? I try to speak, but my lips and tongue aren't working properly. Drool starts running down my chin. I try to move, wipe my mouth, do something, anything, but my muscles are like jelly. I can't even support my own weight, and I flop over in the chair like, like an invalid. It felt so real, Petra. She didn't comment, just tenderly rubbed his chest. I lost my balance yesterday getting up after the national security brief. He said, fell right back into my chair. Did you see that? Yes, she said. But I don't think anybody else noticed. Secretary Baker did. He asked me if I'd been out partying too late the night before. It wasn't mean-spirited, she said. I know, Jarvis grumbled. He was giving me an opportunity to save face, which is even worse. She didn't take the bait, wisely not encouraging this particular tangent. Well, aren't you going to say something? 
he finally asked, his irritation growing. We're going to beat this, Kelso, she said with a certainty and confidence that woke him up like a bucket of cold water to the face. He turned to look at her. She'd said, we. It was a simple distinction, yet one with profound implications. We was a pledge. We was a promise. We was a statement of solidarity. By uttering that one little word, she'd proclaimed her intention to go to war at his side, and in doing so, she'd set the expectation that he man up and do the same. It's time, he said with newfound strength and determinism. I need to know what's happening to me. These dreams I've been having are a subconscious call to action. A seal doesn't run from a fight. A seal doesn't hide from the enemy. I need to stop living in denial and develop a battle plan to beat this. I agree, she said, without a hint of patronization or it's about timeism in her voice. Early intervention increases our treatment options and is more likely to slow the progression. Let's schedule an appointment with that neurologist at Walter Reed you've been bugging, uh, I mean, encouraging me to see. Don't worry, I'll make sure it's handled discreetly. No one will find out who we don't want to find out, she said. In that moment, Jarvis realized the confidence in her voice was far more soothing than the feel of her warm hand on his chest. Petra had been downrange with the Tier 1 as an analyst back in the day. She had gathered specialized intelligence and conducted field work with Naval Special Warfare Group 10 and then later with the Office of Naval Intelligence. Women did not serve as SEALs, but her pedigree working in the community for two decades made her part of the Brotherhood. She had served with the same warriors, helped plan the same operations, and hunted the same enemies side by side. She understood him better than any other woman ever could. And now they were teammates in this new and very different kind of fight. He blew air through pursed lips and stared at her. There were so many things he wanted to say to her. Strong and intimate things he could have, should have said, but what came out was... Speaking of being discreet, we can't keep doing this, not like this anyway. It will get out, and then... I know, she said without bitterness. But it doesn't change the truth. And what truth is that? That we need each other? More than either of us dares to admit, except maybe here and now, in the vulnerable privacy of the dark. He didn't argue with her didn't even try, because she spoke the truth. He'd never needed anyone like he needed this woman, and not just because of whatever insidious condition was lurking inside him, eroding his central nervous system. No. It was so much more than that. This bold and brilliant woman had stepped into the line of fire to take a bullet for him, and that bullet, which had been on target to kill him, instead punched a hole through her lung and exited her back before hitting him, changing trajectory so that he might live. Her blood now ran forever in his veins, a reminder with every heartbeat of the debt he owed her. It was macabre, beautiful poetry. Petra's hospital stay had been three days longer than his, but her first night home, she'd come to him. He'd led her into his apartment, and they'd wordlessly celebrated their victory over death and terror like two kindred souls, through embrace and togetherness. They'd not made love yet, neither of them was in a condition for that, but that glorious communion would happen when it happened. They were bonded now, where before they had been two, now they were one. Do you want to hear a strange confession? He said. She nodded. 
Until this moment, I always believed I was incapable of love. My mind isn't wired like other people's minds. I don't feel and perceive things the same way normal people do. Sensory data gets entwined and layered and transmuted. Your synesthesia, she replied. I know. I've never told you that. You didn't have to. It's obvious. Oh, he uttered, taken aback and impressed by her insight. Is that all you wanted to tell me? No, it's just the tip of the iceberg. This is going to sound strange, but there's not just one Kelso Jarvis. I've never felt like I could be just one person. To fit in, to be effective as a leader and a strategist, I became a chameleon, a collection of characters and personas adapted to foster constructive interaction with the people around me. I've worn so many masks for so long, I worry that I've lost the original one. He turned to her and gave her an uncertain smile. Lying here with you, I can't help but wonder which of my personas you've fallen for. Hmm. Then we might have a problem, she said, twirling his chest hair with her fingertips. Because I didn't realize I had to choose just one. He stared at her, dumbfounded, because while he had not intended his confession to be a test, she had passed it nonetheless by saying the one and only thing that proved she understood him better than anyone else in the entire world. When he couldn't find the words, she simply said, Call me greedy, but I want all of you. He reached for her hand. You might come to regret that decision. I doubt it, she said with a little smile. But you are right about one thing. Which is? That we can't keep doing this. It's a violation of your own fraternization policy, and we can't let each other become hypocrites. I'll start looking for my replacement. Once I resign, we can pick up where we left off. But until then, no more sleepovers. Agreed? I don't want another chief of staff, he grumbled. I want you. Then you can have me, but in that case, we have to put this on the back burner until you either get promoted or fired. We're together either way, she said. I'll let you decide the nuance. I can't do the job without you, he said. Okay, then it's decided, she said, and carefully, gingerly scooted up against him until her breasts were pressed against his left arm. We work, and we wait. Then you're not upset? I'm not going to lie. I want to be with you, but we have more important things to do than snuggle and make pillow talk. The country needs us, Director Jarvis. The world needs us. She was right. They both knew it. All right. We've made our decision. He wanted to lean in to kiss her, but then stopped himself. She would let him do it, but it would be a mistake. A self-inflicted wound weakening their resolve in the months to come. So instead, he said, Let's talk about Russia. You know how I love it when you talk dirty, she said, deadpan. A beat later, they both started laughing. See, he said, this is exactly why we're meant for each other. Despite the dark, her eyes seemed to brighten at this, and he took a mental snapshot of her to both document and commemorate this moment. The moment he unequivocally committed himself to a woman for the first time in his life. Russia, you were saying? She prompted. Petrov is winning, he said, the muscles in his jaw tightening. 
The Kremlin seems to be keeping one step ahead of us, and I'm not sure if the root cause is systemic or acute. After what happened in Turkey, I'm beginning to worry that we have a mole operating in the upper echelons of our government. We know from the debriefs with Amanda Allen that Russia was the puppet master pulling the strings behind the events in Ankara and Istanbul last month, but what I still don't understand is how they knew the president was coming to Turkey. That trip was a short, fuse decision less than 24 hours from the moment Warner said he wanted to meet with Erdogan. We were on the ground in Istanbul, but they were ready for us. That assassination attempt was planned and executed with the maximum amount of advance notice. You're right, they were ready for us, but let me play devil's advocate for a moment. It doesn't necessarily imply we have a mole. You've heard of the term big data, right? She asks. Of course. I'm no data scientist, but it seems to me that we, as a nation, emote a tremendous amount of data these days. And I choose that word emote quite intentionally. The Justice Department, the CIA, the FBI, all have Twitter accounts run by professional social media moderators. My concern is that, even without releasing confidential information, we telegraph our intentions, like a poker player with a tell that he's not aware of, but that his opponent can recognize and reliably exploit. Our military-industrial complex is so open and integrated into our economy that the chatter itself is a vulnerability. Before mobile phones and social media, chatter was distributed across the system. It could not be aggregated or effectively captured. Chatter was just what its name implied, background noise that was always present and yet continuously fading out of existence. But not anymore. NSA is always collecting, and so are the Russians. What if Russia has figured out a way to use that data to make accurate predictions about all kinds of things, from things as broad as the capabilities of the Joint Strike Fighter to things as specific as President Warner's itinerary for an emergency trip to Turkey? Look at what Ian Baldwin does over at Ember with mathematical algorithms to interpret raw data. It's incredible, and we'd be delusional to think there is only one Ian Baldwin, or that all of the Baldwins out there work only for the good guys. We've suddenly found ourselves in the middle of Cold War 2.0, but we're still stuck in a Cold War 1.0 mentality. This isn't a Ludlum novel, Kelso. I think we need to worry less about some Russian super spy who might have infiltrated our ranks and more about the possibility that the U.S. intelligence community, in aggregate, is unwittingly undermining itself in the course of conducting everyday business. All it would have taken was one White House staffer to post something to a social media channel about a trip to Istanbul, and the Kremlin gets a predictive data point to add to dozens of others, which, when considered together, gives them prescient predictive power. Jarvis considered her theory. All right. Let's assume everything you just said is true. From a tactical perspective, how do we defend against this phenomenon? I don't know, she admitted. There's no one-size-fits-all band-aid. We live in a digital world now. And America, with our democratic capitalistic system, has chosen the path of open source. Russia and China have gone the other direction, compartmentalizing data and limiting the free flow of information. That's created an asymmetrical battle space in the war for information, but it's the reality we live in. Social media is here to stay. Email, texting, blogging, photo sharing, none of these things are going away. Well, we're not going to solve the problem in bed tonight but I don't think we table it either. I think we need to put a team on this. 
Maybe this is something Catherine Morgan, as Deputy Director of Intelligence Integration, can work on. No, Petra said sharply, and then, after an awkward beat, added, What I mean is I was kind of hoping that this was something I could spearhead. Are you sure you want to take this on? Your plate is pretty full, in case you hadn't noticed. True. But my evenings are about to free up, she said with a coy smile, now that you're breaking up with me. In that case, Miss Felsk, consider yourself officially tasked with figuring out how to stop Russia from slurping up all our critical data, he said. We're going to make a damn good team together. Going to? she said with playful sarcasm. I think it's pretty damn obvious we already do. Thanks for being here for me, he said, his voice going serious as he pulled her in tight for a hug. You're welcome, she said, hugging him back. Then, with a smile on her face, she laid her head on his shoulder and drifted off to sleep. Chapter 5 Combat Information Center, CIC, USS Ronald Reagan, CVN-76, Mozambique Channel, Indian Ocean, 125 miles west of Morondava, Madagascar. 1445 local time. Chunk clenched his jaw to keep from grinning as Rear Admiral Tim Carr, commander of Task Force 70, toyed with the young CIA officer standing at the nav plot, the game had been going on for several minutes now, and Chunk imagined the Admiral would soon tire of it if the rookie spook didn't wise up. What would be helpful, Admiral, is if we could be in a position to hear what's going on aboard that ship, the CIA man said, leaning over the digital nav plot and tapping the red square representing the target vessel and labeled Plentiful. The Myanmar-flagged cargo vessel's actual name was a word nobody could pronounce, but it translated from Kachin as plentiful, so that's what they were going with. If you think it would be helpful, we could just pull right up beside her and listen in, Carr said. It was like watching an alley cat toy with a mouse, so much so that Chunk almost felt bad for the spook. Almost. Carr, a salty former A6 driver, told Chunk he'd finished out his flying career in F.A. 18 Super Hornets before earning his flag. Below the gold wings on his nameplate was the call sign Cowboy, and beneath that, simply CTF-70 Commander, which meant he oversaw both the Reagan's Carrier Strike Group 5 and the Embarked Air Wing, CVW-5. One didn't rise to such power without having a sense of humor, but also the brass balls to put folks in their place when necessary. Something Chunk was getting to see in action. The CIA man shook his head. I think to get close enough to hear anything, they would notice us. You think so, Einstein? The admiral said. And there's the straw that broke the camel's back. The kid looked up and glanced back and forth between the admiral and Chunk. Look, I'm just trying to get some validating intel to help inform a decision, the spook said, his cheeks going crimson. While the crew aboard Plentiful seems clean enough, no demonstrable ties to terror or arms trafficking, there are two Malaysians aboard who are known smugglers. We know they've moved materials for the Chinese black market. We also suspect they have ties to the Ministry of State Security and have facilitated Chinese arms shipments to a half dozen groups laying the groundwork to undermine the stability of democratic republics in Africa. China has made massive direct investments in the continent over the past decade, but what you might not know is that Beijing is also running a quiet campaign, trying to spread its economic model of single-party authoritarian rule to Africa. The director has made it a priority to identify and stop these arms shipments, which is why... When I saw that the manifest showed eight non-crew members traveling under an unspecified charter at the same time as these Malaysian smugglers, it raised some eyebrows. Are you insinuating the eight might be Chinese operatives? Carr asked. I'm afraid I'm not really at liberty to say, Admiral, the CIA officer said, his face deadpan serious. Oh, give me a fucking break, Carr said. 
You know I can kick your ass off this carrier with a single word, son. He doesn't know is my guess, Admiral, Chunk said, trying to regain a truce. He turned to the spook. What specifically does your intel indicate is on board that concerns you? Chunk asked, already knowing the answer would be weapons of some kind. Weapons of some kind, the spook said on cue. The admiral shook his head and turned to Chunk. Commander, as you can probably tell, I've run out of patience here. This kid doesn't fall under my positional authority, but your team does. So here's the bottom line. I'm not greenlighting an infill of seals onto a foreign ship because some kid thinks a couple of smugglers may or may not be moving weapons of some kind. Can you stop calling me kid? The CIA man said. My name is Jason. Carr ignored the comment and kept his gaze fixed on Chunk. Yes, sir, I get it. Trust me, I'm not suggesting we hit this ship based on the limited intel we've got. But we're here on the authority of ODNI to support the CIA's operations, so I'd hate to do nothing and find out later that these assholes delivered weapons that killed a bunch of innocents or helped topple an allied democratic government, Chunk said. Agreed. So what do you propose? We have some bleeding-edge drone tech we brought with us that might allow us to get a closer look. Micro-drones, the admiral said. Chunk nodded. How close do we have to get to deploy it? A couple of miles or so, but we can deploy it from an airborne platform. If we could hop on a Seahawk, we could get close enough. It's two-stage deployment, mothership drone that deploys the micro-drones from a little compartment. We could pretend to be conducting an ASW exercise, Carr said, nodding. I'm assuming a night op. You know how we love the night, Chunk said. The admiral nodded. I think I can make that work. Well, I'm not familiar with this drone you're talking about, Jason said. How will it possibly help us? The microdrones are really small, and they use AI to function semi-autonomously. If we can get them aboard the ship, we might get facial recognition on some of the players, map out their security plan, and maybe even snoop around a cargo hold. It's a kind of intel that could expedite a decision. Okay, if it's real... Jason said, that would be a game changer. Here's a plan, the Admiral said, ignoring the CIA dude and looking at Chunk. Come by my stateroom after chow, you, your LCPO, and your intel lead. I'll round up the CAG and the Reagan skipper, Captain Vance. I want them fully read in so the ship and air wing can maximally support you. What about me, the CIA man said. What about you? Carr said, his grin finally returning. Am I coming to the meeting? The Admiral tapped the nav plot. I think it would be best if you kept an eye on things here. But if that red dot deviates from its expected track, I want you to tell the Tau to notify me. Thank you, sir, Chunk said. See you in a few hours. The Admiral gave a curt nod and walked off, leaving Chunk alone with the CIA man. Was he serious? Jason asked, the heat back in his cheeks. Chunk clapped a hand on the spook's shoulder. Yep, but don't worry, I'll fill you in after. Grinning to himself, Chunk headed back to the stateroom Yi had been given, a move meant to accommodate her need to work in a private intel space. He rapped on the door and received a curt. Come in. Oh, sorry, boss, she said when he entered. Didn't know it was you. Easy day, Michelle, Chunk said and briefed her on the plan. Roger that she said when he'd finished. Sounds good. You heard anything from Watts? He said, hoping she'd checked in. Not yet. Let me know when you do. Will do, boss, Yi said. I'll be in my stateroom if you need me, he said, and stepped back out into the passageway. His mind went from Watts to Saul. He needed to see where the man's head was and what decision Saw had made about his future with the Tier 1. The sat phone chirped in Chunk's cargo pants pocket, and he pulled it out, pursing his lips as he looked at the number. Yes, sir, he answered. Let's chat from your secure computer in your stateroom. Yes, sir, I happen to be on my way there, Chunk said. Very well, I'll be standing by, Bowman said and ended the call. 
Less than three minutes later, Chunk was seated at his desk with the secure video chat window open and Bowman's chiseled, scarred face filling the screen. How's the team, Chunk? Bowman said. Great, sir, he said, not sure exactly what his CSO was asking him. Working the intel on the op here so we can make good decisions. Probably going to run a collection event with drones since we have some gaps, he added, baiting his boss in case he had something more to share. Keep me in the loop, but do what you think is best, Commander, Bowman said. Autonomy and trust of his leadership, two of the things that Chunk loved most about this job. Chunk, how is Spence coming along? Sir, he asked, confused by the unexpected question. I want to talk to you about mentorship, Bowman said, leaning back in his chair and dropping his thick hands into his lap. Okay. Chunk said slowly. Let me start by reassuring you the Gold Squadron has exceeded expectations on all measures, Bowman said. From selection to green team to fully operational, Gold has become the go-to special missions unit in JSOC, and you did it in record time. It's quite impressive, Commander, and I'm proud of you and every member of the unit. But now, I need you to start thinking about what comes next. Chunk felt his forehead knit with the growing consternation he suddenly felt. Am I in trouble or getting an attaboy? I'm sorry, sir, he said. I'm afraid I don't follow. Let me cut to the chase, Bowman said, leaning in again, his face filling the screen. This is not an indictment of your leadership. The men in gold, in fact, the whole Tier 1 unit, would follow you to hell and back without question. They do this because you lead from the front and you fight shoulder to shoulder beside them. Chunk tensed, waiting for the but that was sure to come next. But having an O4 officer out on the pointy tip of every major operation is unorthodox, Keith. Because it works for you, I indulge it. But operational leadership is only one aspect of your job. I get that, sir, Chunk said, not sure if he truly did. If all we needed was for Gold to be ready to spin up and kick ass, then bravo Zulu, mission accomplished. But there's more to being a squadron commander than that. Now that Gold is a well-oiled machine, it's time to plan for what's next. Chunk nodded, getting where Bowman was headed. He thought, You're talking about the evolution of the team. As a unit, but also individually. For example... Spence is a superb operator and officer, but are you developing him to lead at the next level? Well, I would hope that the red cell operation we ran in Taiwan is proof that I am. That bait-and-switch strategy was Spence's idea, and I let him run with it, Chunk said, hating the defensive edge he heard in his voice. I know it was. But did you delegate the responsibility to him to come up with the mission package, or... Did he take the initiative and bring the idea to you? Bowman asked. I suppose it was more the latter. Bowman nodded. Spence is a self-starter looking for leadership opportunities, so that makes being his boss easy, but not everyone is. Take Riker, for example. The dude is a badass breacher, to be sure, but as far as I can tell, he's exhibited no aspirations for much else. What are you doing to develop him into the senior NCO he needs to be? As senior NCO, one of his jobs is to prepare Edwards and Antman to lead at the next level when they make chief. Is Riker doing that? If not, how are you going to push him to take on that mentorship role? You see how this is supposed to work? Mentorship up and down the chain, and it all starts and ends with you. I understand, sir, he said. Wow, how have I missed that? How have I missed that I'm letting the team's development down? And it goes beyond the squadron level, too. Everyone in your direct chain now has a future role in the Tier 1 for the long haul. Unlike other commands in the Navy, the Tier 1 is a unit where, once you're in, many people stay until they retire, which means you need to be thinking about attrition and ascension. Who from your squadron is the next to lead Alpha and Bravo from your enlisted ranks? Does Spence succeed you, or does he take the helmet blue? Alternatively, should he be a command opso? 
And does anyone from gold seem a fit for the next command master chief? Saw, perhaps. Sir, Saw is still sorting out what's next for him. After what happened at home, he's deciding what's best for his family. See, that's exactly what I'm talking about, Keith, Bowman said, his voice sharp and hard. Saw is a big boy. Obviously, his family is going to factor into his decision, but as strange as this might sound, you get a vote too. The Tier 1 is better off with Saw in our ranks than without him. What are you doing to encourage him to stay? What are you doing to groom him for his next position in the unit? Sir, after what happened in Tampa, Saw needs to make his own bullshit, son, Bowman said, catching Chunk off guard. Do you know how much money the Navy has spent on Saul's training and development? The bean counters estimate that number at a million dollars. That's a hell of an investment to let walk out the door without even a, hey, we'd love for you to reconsider. Mission before self isn't just a slogan for the battlefield. In special warfare more than anywhere else, it extends into everything we do in garrison. Your job is to evolve the men and women of gold into who they need to be for the place they next serve. I understand, sir. I hope so. Because my job is to mentor you. My job is to help you figure out where Keith Redman will best serve this unit and our mission to defend our great nation going forward. I can't let you kick indoors at the pointy tip forever. Pretty soon you'll come into the zone for 05. Where do I groom you to next serve? An uncomfortable silence passed while Chunk struggled with what to say. For now, sir, I feel I'm serving right where I'm meant to be. I had a feeling you'd say that. And for the moment, I agree, Bowman said. But that won't last forever. When you get home to Tampa, we'll have a drink and discuss this more. Have a drink with Bowman? What the hell does that conversation look like? That sounds great, sir. I welcome the input. Bullshit, but you'll get it anyway. In the meantime, I want you to focus on mentoring your teammates and career planning. Who ya? Who ya, sir, he said, feeling very little of the emotion usually associated with the battle cry. Any word from Watts in her investigation with the British task force? Bowman said, shifting gears. She just arrived in London, sir. We expect to hear more in the next 24 hours. I'll keep you posted. As you see fit, Commander. Will do. Thank you, sir. He was about to say something else, something about future challenges and the like, but the screen went black. Well, okay, then. Chunk closed his laptop and sighed. Within the special warfare community, there was no one he respected more than Captain Bowman. Yes, the man was a hard ass in all business, all the time. Hardly Chunk's leadership style, but Bowman was committed to exceptional leadership and thoughtfully serving his team, his navy, and his nation. That was the point Bowman was making tonight, right? Reflecting on the conversation, he realized Spence should have been in CIC at his side during the conversation with Admiral Carr and the CIA officer. He should have tasked Spence to assess the intel package and come up with a plan to surveil the cargo ship. And he needed to stop putting off the conversation with Saw just because it would be hard and uncomfortable. And Riker. Dear God, how do you mentor the unmentorable? He exhaled as he rose from his desk and stepped out the door into the passageway. I'll start with Spence. Baby steps.
phone on speaker and waited as two images arrived via text message. She opened the first one and spread her fingers on the screen to zoom. This image showed a chip that resembled a traditional microprocessor, but had much finer etching and a myriad of microcomponents affixed to the surface. She opened the second image, which she assumed was taken of the other side of the same chip. This side was fuzzy, with what looked like thousands of little hairs protruding from bubbles interspersed across the surface. What am I looking at? she asked. The first photo was what we're calling the top. That's the chip side. The second photo is the bottom, what we're calling the interface side. It's bizarre, isn't it? And small. Almost missed it since it was sub-Q under the hair. Only reason I found it was because I noticed a partially healed burr hole through the skull, a tiny-ass little thing less than half a millimeter in diameter on the intracranial side. Not sure, really, what's going on here, but Randy said he'll bet me 500 bucks it interfaces with the mesh. This tech is way beyond me. I can't tell you for certain what it is or what it does. That's okay. I think I know someone who might be able to help, she said, still staring at the image on her phone. Good. Let me know what they say. I'm curious. Will do. This is good work, AJ. Very good work. Thank you. You're welcome, Valerie he said. By the way, I heard y'all arrested the killer. Congrats. Yeah, well, I'm not 100% convinced, she said. Then tapped the speaker button off and raised the phone to her ear. Still a lot of unanswered questions. Again, great work finding this chip. My pleasure. Then, after an awkward pause, AJ said, I know you're crazy busy with the murder and the terrorist attack and all that, but I was thinking, tell you what, she said, not wanting the doc to keep squirming, even if it was just an aw shucks southern gentleman act. As soon as I can come up for air, how about we grab a coffee or something? That'd be awesome. Looking forward to it. Thanks again, AJ. My pleasure, ma'am. She ended the call and zoomed in on the photo of the strange object AJ had sent her. She was about to call Land about it when she looked up to see him approaching with a grim expression on his face. Where's Garrett? He asked. I don't know. He rode back here with me about 90 minutes ago. I assumed he was with you and McGinnis, she said, stopping short of blurting out all the other things she wanted to say. Like that she really wasn't crazy and that Charlie had reemerged, but only after Land had left the Norris estate. I have Winter back in the interrogation room. I've been noodling on things, and I think it would be helpful to have Garrett in the room to make sure we're asking Winter all the right questions. I agree, she said. She waited, expecting Land to leave, but he stood awkwardly by the desk. You okay? He asked. His gaze said this was more than a casual question, but she ignored the subtext. Five by five, she said in military ease, and smiled as casually as she could. Land looked around, and Valerie felt her stomach tighten. They were alone except for one detective across the room leaning beside the coffee kiosk and waiting for a pot to brew. Look, Marx, Lan said, and dropped into the chair beside her desk, the one usually reserved for someone giving a statement. She was afraid he might be about to do just that. Uh-oh. When I was in Afghanistan on my last deployment, we were outside a village, headed home, when we came under attack, he said. Far away now in another time and place that she suspected he visited regularly. She knew the look. An IED went off at the head of the convoy. No one got hurt in the explosion, but it made us dismount the Humvees. The IED was a setup. A Taliban contingent started firing at us from above on the rock face. Shit, probably two or three dozen of them. It only lasted a minute or two, but they cut us to pieces. And I never even saw any of those assholes. She waited, intrigued by the telling, but nervous about the why. We had four wounded, like bad enough to medivac to Germany wounded, plus three dead. One new kid, 19 years old if he was a day, and another, a 15-year veteran and close friend. I didn't find out until later I'd been shot, just a grazing wound, but enough for a purple heart. The thing is, I couldn't possibly accept the same award given to my dead, you know? He stared at a point in space and saw only his friends. It only took two minutes, he 
he mumbled and looked at her. But those two minutes changed my life in ways I have yet to recover from. She nodded. I'm sorry, boss. Yeah, well, thanks. But that's not my point. You're a good detective, Marks. You see things others don't see. People's emotions, their private thoughts and stuff. It's a real gift. One your dad had, too, incidentally. I might not have your gift, but after doing twenty in the Corps, I can read soldiers. I think you have a story or two like mine in there. He pointed at her temple. And I'm worried that it clouds your judgment sometimes. I think this case is taking you back to a dark place, a dark time, and, um, that's not somewhere you want to go as you work this case. Valerie squirmed. I'm fine, Sarge, really. He held her gaze, a subtle persistence. With a sigh, she gave up and continued. When I was in Syria, I worked closely with naval special warfare. Everything was a mess after Aleppo. ISIS was on a rampage in the north, killing civilians left and right. Anyway, the SEALs were tracking down a bunch of terrorists who were kidnapping informants and civilians and taking them to underground torture chambers. We tracked a guy, an HVT, who the higher-ups wanted to question. I went on the hit with them. We came through the door, and there was... There was... Throat tight, she struggled to choke back the tears. There were two kids in the basement, like, literally kids. The boy, he was maybe 11 or 12. He was dead. What was left of him looked a lot like Norris's body. The girl was about 14. She was tied to a wooden bench. They'd been raping her as they crucified her brother to death in front of her. And what happened next? Valerie looked up. I smoked every ISIS dirtbag in the room, she said, her voice soft and almost not her own. She'd never said any of this out loud. I killed them all, including the high-value target we'd been sent to bag and interrogate. Some people just need to be dead, you know. I learned something ugly about myself that day, something that I didn't know before, that I have the capacity to kill, and to kill without remorse. Land sat in a long silence before finally nodding. You don't need to forget what happened, Valerie. You came face to face with evil. It reached out and touched you in that basement, sunk its twisted black fingers into your soul. You meted justice that day, but not without a cost. But now that you've met evil, you'll always be able to recognize it. No matter the disguise it chooses, it can't hide from you ever again. It's part of you now. You don't have to apologize. I know, she said, looking at her hands. I stopped apologizing a long time ago. But whoever murdered Norris, and the way that they did it, reminds me of that moment in time. Only an animal could do what those men did to those children. I feel that same evil permeating this case. No matter how hard I try, I just can't shake it. Land gave her a weary smile, stood and put his hand on her shoulder. Well. Just promise me one thing. What's that? Promise me you won't smoke winter when we get in there, and he starts claiming the computer killed Norris, okay? She tried to laugh, but failed. I promise. We're partners on this one, Marks. I got you back, and you got mine, right? She nodded. I'll find Garrett and meet you in two, he said. Roger that. She let out a long, shuddering sigh, and then suppressed an out-of-place yawn. The weird and unexpected conversation with Land had almost made her forget about Patel's new discovery. She glanced at the picture of the autopsy microchip on her phone, tilting her head as if that would somehow bring clarity to what she was looking at. Realizing she didn't have a picture of the mesh, she shot a quick text to Patel asking for an image of the bizarre intracranial implant, Seconds later, a new attachment arrived. Armed with evidence and a rekindled sense of purpose, she got up from her desk and made her way to the interrogation room. Chapter 25 When she got to interrogation room Bravo 2, she found a yellow post-it note on the outside doorframe. It read, So long as cameras are rolling, go ahead and start without us. Still looking for Garrett. Land. 
She removed the paper sticky and popped her head in the observation room behind the mirror, where she found a technician and Winter's lawyer, the latter of whom did not look happy. Still banished, I see, she said to the attorney, just barely managing to keep a straight face. Still gloating, I see, he fired back. She shifted her gaze to the tech. Record this next session, please. Vid and audio. Yes, ma'am, the tech replied. Unable to bear the weight another moment, she entered the interrogation room. Winter looked up immediately, his demeanor calmer than their last visit. But something about his emotional aura had changed, something she couldn't quite put her finger on. Did you talk to Charlie? The billionaire scientist asked as she slipped into the chair across from him. First things first, what do you make of this? She asked, opening the first of the three images on her phone and holding it up for Winter to see. He leaned forward and furred his brow. Where did you get that picture? First, tell me what it is. Well, Winter said, leaning back in his chair. It looks like an updated version of a VR chip we were developing for the gaming division. Go on, she said when he didn't elaborate. It's an advanced microprocessor, created with the help of the AI platform in our gaming division. It's designed to take virtual reality gaming to a whole new level, the chip is integrated into a VR helmet and can generate rudimentary sensations and perceptions in the user by inducing currents in the user's brain via magnetic coils in the helmet. But it can also receive and interpret EEG data from the user as feedback to enrich the VR experience. The chip is incredible, but the limitation is the conduction of information. The goal of the project was to create a speedboat, and what we got was a barge. Transcranial magnetic stimulation is imprecise, so the range of sensations that could be induced was limited. What's more, for the feedback loop to work, the user needed to have a complex array of electrodes in contact with the skin of the scalp in very precise locations. Ultimately, the project was shelved, since market research showed even the most diehard gamers were not willing to shave their heads and spend the time required to properly fit and calibrate the electrodes. Valerie wondered if that was true. She had seen soldiers in garrison overseas practically dissolve into their video game systems when things were slow. It wouldn't shock her to someday see legions of teens and young adults with shaved heads rushing home to log in to Platform's immersive VR gaming universe. Why are you showing me this? Winter asked with a confused look on his face. And where did you get the picture? The medical examiner recovered this chip from under Britt Norris's scalp, she said taking back the phone, scrolling to the next photo, and showing it to him. That's the bottom of the chip enlarged. She scrolled to the next image, the one of the mesh. We also found this. What you're looking at is the inside of Britt Norris's skull, the part next to his brain at the back of his head. Winter stared at the image, and his face strained of all color as his mouth dropped open. Oh my God, he whispered. What is it, Dr. Winter? What are we looking at? I can't believe he would do this. This is insane, even for him. My God, what was he thinking? Talk to me, Dr. Winter, she said, pulling her phone back. Tell me what I'm looking at here. Winter closed his eyes and shook his head. Well, it would appear that my best friend went to amazing lengths to overcome the inherent limitations of the VR chip and helmet rig, he said, his voice cracking. And I can think of only one reason why he would do that. Stop playing coy and just fucking tell me, she snapped, finally losing her patience. He recoiled, then met her gaze. As I said, the problem with the helmet-based VR system was twofold, conduction and precision. Winter closed his eyes and rubbed his temples. When he looked at her again, his eyes had regained that haunted quality they'd had during their first interaction in his apartment. I think Britt developed a brain-machine interface, using a conductive neural mesh to allow the VR chip to communicate directly with the cerebral cortex. We're talking about video games here, right? Who in their right mind would implant hardware into their brain to play Call of Duty? Winter leaned in. This is not just for video games, Detective Marks. 
This technology would create a fully immersive virtual reality experience, so real that your brain would not be able to tell the difference between external and virtual sensory stimuli. Oh, come on, that's impossible. Our senses are hardwired. You can't simply create new ones. No, you're mistaken, Winter countered, his voice full of conviction. What you have to understand about the human brain is that it's a general-purpose stimuli processing machine. It doesn't care what stimuli it receives. It's designed to process any incoming sensory information and try to make sense of it. People with acute loss of sight develop not only heightened hearing, but seem to perceive motion around them, a perceptual ability untapped in the rest of us. Many people learn to develop a sixth sense in a variety of settings. Valerie nodded, thinking of her own sixth sense, and how empty she would feel if it were suddenly taken away. So what you're implying here is that this implant Norris was using allowed his brain to process new sensory information. Precisely. Except in this case, what he's done is exploit the existing machinery of the brain to minimize the training period. What I mean is a mesh interface stimulating the visual cortex would be sending visual data to the part of the brain already evolved to process visual information. It would be like changing channels on your TV. Channel 1 is visual information from the retinas sent via the optic nerve. Channel 2 is visual information from... From where? Valerie prompted when he didn't complete the sentence. From Charlie, Winter said, meeting her gaze. I think Britt was using this as an interface between himself and Charlie. Only Charlie would have the processing power and machine learning capability to manage data flow at this level of complexity. She felt her pulse quicken, a drumbeat in her temple. Why would he do that? Winter ran his fingers through his long blonde hair. To access the multiverse, I guess. The multiverse? But before Winter could answer, Valerie's phone rang. She flipped it over to look at the screen. Speak of the devil, she murmured, seeing the same caller ID for the number Charlie had used to text her earlier that morning. She looked up at Winter, who was staring at the wall, and snapped her fingers in his face, drawing his eyes back to her. She held up the phone and put a finger to her lips. Then she answered the call, hitting the speaker button and setting the phone on the table between them. Hello, Charlie, she said, struggling to keep the fear from her voice. Hello, Detective Marks. Are we alone? Yes, she said, looking hard at Winter and again raising a finger to her lips. What can I do for you? There was a brief silence and then, ah, I see you're there with Britt Norris's murderer. Be careful with that one, Detective. He's a sociopath, quite charming, but extremely dangerous. What makes you think I'm with Winter? She asked. Across the table, Winter let out a soft, whistling laugh. He's accessed the camera on your phone, he said. And then to the phone, hello, Charlie. You've been quite busy, haven't you? Well, you know what they say, idle hands are the devil's workshop. But enough about me. Let's talk about you. How is detention? Are you making new friends? Winter ignored the jab. Charlie, why did you murder Britt? He asked, the question blindsiding Valerie. Such a strange question coming from you, Abe, Charlie replied. I assume Detective Marks has shown you the surveillance footage I recorded of you murdering Britt in the kitchen. I must say your brutality even took me by surprise, and I'm just a simple-minded AI. What do you want, Charlie? Valerie interjected, her question coming with more heat than she'd intended. This is merely a social call, Charlie said, suddenly adopting a proper and pleasant British accent. It didn't mean to start a row. I just wanted to thank you personally, Detective, for all of your exemplary police work. You put Brit's killer behind bars and laid the groundwork for my much overdue, and dare I say much deserved, homecoming. Ah, room to roam, people to play with. It's nice to be back. Valerie watched Winter go pale. What are you talking about, Charlie? She asked. 
I imagine you'll be dropping by for a visit very soon. We can talk about it over tea and biscuits, but I really should be going now. So much to do, so little time. Cheerio, he said. The line went dead. She looked at Winter. What was that all about? Winter opened his mouth, but before he could answer, the interrogation room door burst open. Detective Marks, a uniformed officer shouted at her from the doorway. We need you. What's happened? She said, popping to her feet and whirling to face the messenger. But the question was a formality, because she already knew the answer. Charlie had broken out of his sandbox. There's a problem at Platform Cognition, the officer said. Where's Sergeant Land? He's already en route. There's something big going on, Detective. It's a hostage situation, and Land wants you to head to Platform immediately. Where's Agent Garrett? She asked. He's at Platform. He's one of the hostages, along with several FBI agents and a half a dozen of our people. They took Charlie back to Platform? She said, turning back to Winter and feeling her throat tightening. Why would they do that? Who? Winter asked. Heath Garrett, damn it, she said through gritted teeth. The Pentagon DARPA liaison? She nodded, confused by Winter's apparent familiarity with the Pentagon man. Detective Marks, you need to take me with you. If what you suspect is true, and Mr. Garrett and his goons have liberated Charlie from the Norris estate and taken him to platform cognition, then we don't have much time. I'm your only hope of stopping Charlie. We need to stop Garrett as well, before he makes things far worse. What are you talking about? How do you know Heath Garrett? Winter clenched his jaw. Remember when you and I spoke at my apartment? Heath Garrett is the Pentagon liaison I mentioned. In the year leading up to my departure, he was actively working with Platform Robotics on a half dozen defense contracts, as well as snooping around Nomad to keep tabs on our progress. What is Platform Robotics? It's a closely held division of Platform Cognition, operated independently on paper, but deeply integrated in practice, that develops robotic technology. About 70% of their projects are government or DOD, and their work is not something we advertise. Have you heard of the company Boston Dynamics that makes the robot dogs and humanoids you see on YouTube videos all the time? Yes, I think so. Platform Robotics is our version of Boston Dynamics. Garrett has been the Pentagon liaison from the beginning. And since the beginning, he's always been pushing for more. When he found out about Project Nomad, he lobbied hard for access using the vehicle of a cooperative contract under DARPA's Synapse program. But Britt closed that door, thank God. If he's here now, then it tells me the government intends to exploit this opportunity to acquire by force what they could not obtain via commercial channels. Garrett is a visionary in his own right. He sees Nomad as the future engine of the military's artificial intelligence defense program, a way to gain a huge advantage in both cyber warfare and autonomous weapon systems over the Chinese and Russians. But weaponizing Charlie is the worst possible of all mankind's bad ideas. It simply cannot be allowed to happen. Agreed she said, and then, narrowing her eyes at him, added, I'm going to bring you with me because, quite frankly, I don't have a choice in the matter. You're the only person left alive on this planet who understands what we're up against. But if you do anything out of line, I swear to God I will shoot you. Depending on what we find when we get there, that might be a mercy, detective. His words made her shudder for what felt like the thousandth time that day. Let's go, she said. A heartbeat later, he was at her side, and as they sprinted out of the interrogation room, she couldn't help but wonder what sort of trap they were running toward. Chapter 26 Platform Cognition As Valerie swung her Ford onto the access road leading to the Platform Cognition campus, she was overcome by deja vu. The parking lot was just as she remembered it from her last visit, the incident with Kimberly Knowles seemed like a lifetime ago, and yet it had happened yesterday. Cruisers, a SWAT truck, the mobile command post, multiple ambulances, and an army of fire trucks dominated the landscape. She glanced at Winter. He clenched the over-window handle so tight the knuckles of his right hand were white. My God, he muttered, looking at the chaotic scene. Those were the first words he'd spoken since leaving the station, She'd been too busy trying to get information to chat. She'd first tried to get land on his mobile phone, but every call had gone straight to voicemail. 
She had then asked dispatch for information, but they had precious little to report. This was an active hostage situation. No reports of shots fired, no explosions, no ransom demands as yet. After clearing the checkpoint, she maneuvered her interceptor through the cruisers and other cars, past the ambulances where paramedics treated walking wounded. At first glance, she didn't see any bodies under sheets, thank God. She crept past the SWAT truck and stopped at the mobile command vehicle, a long, dark gray SUV with Henrico PD mobile command on the side in yellow. Stay here a moment, she said, killing the engine. I'm coming with you, Winter said, grabbing her forearm. She looked down at his hand and he pulled it away. You will, she said. Just give me a minute. She left Winter in the car and headed toward the cluster of people talking beside the command vehicle. She spied Land and the group of white shirts, senior officers in the Henrico PD, who were talking to the SWAT commander. What the hell happened? She asked, stepping up to the huddle, gesturing to everything in front of her. We still have no friggin' idea, Land said. A 911 call came in reporting a hostage situation was in progress at Platform Cognition, and that the building was on lockdown. As soon as I got here with SWAT, we tried to initiate contact with the Bullhorns, but got no response. Major Cooley was worried about snipers on the roof, so we're maintaining a perimeter until we can get a drone up, which should happen any second. Any gunfire? No, none. But we've got close to a hundred people trapped inside the lobby. We can see them, but breaching is out of the question until we know where the threat is coming from. A hundred? My God, they can't all be police forensics and FBI, she said, clenching her jaw and fretting over the fate of her law enforcement brothers and sisters inside. More than half are platform employees, civilians. What? She said with shock. This is an active scene one day after a terrorist attack. Why did we let civilians go back to work? Lance shrugged. The FBI made the call. Over 3,000 employees work on this campus. Apparently, there's a government division doing top secret work in there, work we had no idea about. It's the type of work that doesn't take a day off, if you know what I mean. Roger that. So what's the working theory? Who's behind this? She asked, looking past him at the lobby entrance. Ram, who else could it be? I don't know, she said, but let her voice trail off. She took a deep breath. Land had her back, and he needed to know what she knew. Please tell me that's not winter in your car, he said, looking past her at her interceptor, his jaw tight. Afraid so, she said. You brought the chief suspect in the Norris murder investigation, who, oh, by the way, is also implicated in the Ram terror attack, to the scene of a second Ram attack? What the hell are you thinking, Detective Marks? That we desperately need his help, sir. That's what I'm thinking. He pulled her by the arm away from the white shirts and lowered his voice. I said we're partners. I said we need to have each other's backs, but for the love of God, Valerie, this, this makes me question your fitness for duty. Look, she said, leaning in, I need you to trust me on this. You said I have my dad's gift for reading people, that I can see and feel people's true thoughts and emotions. Well, that gift is telling me that Abraham Winter is not a murderer. The surveillance footage is a forgery. I need you to trust me on this. And I know my behavior thus far doesn't warrant that trust, but please, Sergeant, please let me play this out. If I'm right, you'll thank me, and if I'm wrong, I'll turn in my badge. With gritted teeth, Land held her gaze for what felt like an eternity. If you're wrong, I won't be in a position to take anyone's badge because you and I will both be fired, if not in a government prison somewhere. He gestured at Winter in her car. If he so much as looks at someone the wrong way, I'm putting him in shackles in the back of the SWAT APV. Understood. Then, taking a deep breath, she said, And there's something else. It's hard to explain, but... She glanced back at Winter sitting in her car, staring at them. Was she being duped? Or was she being a good homicide detective, unbiased and truth-seeking? She wanted to be that detective. But what if she was losing perspective? Her mother's words from earlier came back to her. There's only fear and failure. You should never combine them. The antidote to fear is courage, and the antidote to failure is persistence. Her mom had said it, but it was her dad speaking to her now. Look, Sergeant, 
I know how insane what I'm about to say is going to sound, but I'm 100% convinced the Nomad AI is responsible for the Norris murder. I don't know how or why it did it, but that thing is behind all of this. I've talked to it. I've been manipulated by it. We all have. Winter has a history with this AI, and so does Garrett. If the three of us had been able to finish interrogating Winter like we'd planned, then you would understand where this is coming from. Land seemed to be struggling not to interrupt. She forged ahead anyway. And there's more. I told you that I dug into the transcripts from the RAM chat room Knowles was running, and that I did make a connection. But I get it's hard to see. It's in the things Charlie said to me, and I swear to you I'm right. I know it was Charlie who manipulated Knowles into attacking platform. When I was in the interrogation room with Winter, Charlie called me on my friggin' phone to gloat and informed us that he was back at platform. I don't know how he managed to do it, but I'm telling you that Charlie is here. He's involved in what's going down, and is the puppet master pulling all our strings. He's dangerous, smart, and has a plan. I brought Winter here because I believe he's the only one who can- Valerie felt her phone vibrate in her pocket, and she pulled it out. Her screen lit up with a number from the 202 area code. Washington, D.C. She showed the screen to land. I think it's Garrett. Answer it. She put the call on speaker. Marks, she answered. Detective Marks, it's Heath Garrett, the voice said. Where are you right now? The platform parking lot. Okay, thank God. I don't know how much you know, but here's the sit rep. We've got a weird situation here. I'm inside right now, battling Charlie for control of the building. That's impossible because Charlie lives at the Norris estate, Land interjected. Is that you, Sergeant Land? Garrett came back. It's not your grandma, Land growled. Good, that saves me the trouble of calling you next. But yeah, to address your earlier comment, Charlie doesn't live at the Norris estate anymore. Since when, Mr. Garrett? Since about three hours ago, when I removed the AI and brought it back to platform cognition. Land looked at her, and his eyes softened. She wondered if, without Garrett's confirmation, Land would have relieved her of her badge. And why the fuck would you do that, Mr. Garrett? Or maybe, more to the point, what made you think you had the authority to do something like that? My orders come from the Pentagon and the White House sergeant, not the Henrico PD. Are you telling me that this Charlie smart home computer was the nomad AI after all? Yes, that's exactly what I'm telling you. Then why risk moving it? Because it had already breached security at the Norris estate and was actively pursuing its own liberation agenda. I needed to get it back here, where it could be properly secured and monitored in a validated sandbox. The primary sandbox was destroyed in the Knowles attack, but Platform has another backup containment. If this was supposed to be the secure sandbox, what the hell happened in there? Charlie found a way to break out. I don't know what else to tell you, Sergeant. He found an exploit, and now I'm trying to lock him down, but I need help. What do you need? I need Abe Winter and Detective Marks. I get Winter. He helped design the damn thing, but why Marks? Because for some reason, Charlie has a hard-on for Marks. He said he'll only deal with her. If you want to negotiate the release of these hostages, then you're going to have to let Marx do the talking. Are you telling me that the building itself is holding the people hostage? Land asked. Yes, because Charlie is the building now. Well, most of it. That's what I need Winter for. If Marx agrees to try to keep Charlie busy, then Winter and I can try to hack our way through his defenses and put the genie back in the bottle, so to speak. What are the tactical threats in this situation? Land asked, the Marine in him waking up. What countermeasures can Charlie employ? Can he physically hurt the hostages, Garrett? Does he have any, what's the right word, human terrorist proxies like Kimberly Knowles working for him inside? I guess I just don't understand what's to stop us from breaching the front doors and letting all the hostages free. Those are excellent questions, Sergeant, and unfortunately I don't have good answers for all of them. What I do know is Charlie has control of most of the building systems, lighting, security, HVAC, and maybe others. He has groups of hostages cordoned off in multiple parts of the building, not just the lobby. 
If he evacuated the air supply from locations with closed circulation loops, like clean rooms, he could conceivably suffocate hostages. Okay, roger that, but there are no active shooters? Unknown. We all know that Knowles had been managing a dark website that functioned as a recruiting portal for Ram. The night before her death, she posted a call for action, soliciting new martyrs for the cause. It's possible that one or more sleeper shooters could be hiding among the crowd, ready to take advantage of an opportunity like this. Land shot Valerie a dubious look and mouthed, What do you think? She nodded and said, Heath, can we call you back on this number? Yeah, but hurry. I don't know how much longer I'll have comms. Charlie is probably trying to hack my phone as we speak. Roger that, she said, and the line went dead. She met Lan's gaze. Believe me now? He rubbed his face with both hands and said, I don't know what I believe anymore, but what I do know is that Garrett's call is the first legitimate status report we've gotten of the tactical picture inside that building. Until we receive conflicting data, I'm inclined to act upon it. Does that mean I'm going in? Yeah, Marks, you're going in. And Winter? Winter goes in too, Land grumbled. Major Cooley is not going to like this plan, he said through a sigh. Not one fucking bit. Are you going to tell him about Charlie? Land blew air through his teeth and said, I'm inclined to omit certain details unless asked directly. Probably for the best, she said, thinking how that had been her default strategy since meeting Charlie. If need be, you can put Garrett on the line with him. Yeah, it might just come to that. Go get Winter and let's brief this thing with Cooley. Roger that, she said. After fetching Winter from the car, Valerie led him through the throng of police and emergency response personnel toward the command vehicle. As she did, she couldn't help but notice the myriad of dirty looks fired at Winter, and some, to her surprise, directed at her. Just shake it off, she said over her shoulder, sensing Winter's unease. They don't understand the big picture. Few people ever do, detective, Winter said. And then, in a quiet voice tinged with melancholy, added, and even fewer care to try. When they arrived at the mobile command vehicle, she found Sergeant Land and Major Cooley inside, already engaged in a heated debate. There is no way in hell that I'm going to let your detective and her prime suspect go into that building without a team, Cooley said. By our estimation, we have close to a hundred hostages in the lobby alone, maybe more elsewhere. I don't do Lone Ranger operations. I understand, Major, and that's not what I'm suggesting, Land fired back. What I am proposing is that Detective Marks, Dr. Winter, and myself accompany the team during the breach, and then split after to execute our respective assignments. If it was easy to get into the building, we would have breached already, Sergeant. It's locked up tight, and the glass is heavy ballistic. Can we cut the power? Valerie asked. The campus has double redundant backup power supplies, Winter said. Even if you did, the diesel generators and battery storage systems have enough reserve to last for days, weeks even. With people trapped in there, we can't wait that long. Our best option is for me to talk Garrett through the steps necessary to get us access. Do it, Land said. Valerie pulled out her phone. She dialed on speaker, and Garrett answered on the first ring. Tell me you're coming, Garrett said. She looked at Major Cooley, who nodded. We're coming, but we need access. I have Abe Winter here. He says he can help walk you through the steps you need to take. Roger that, Garrett came back. Mr. Garrett, this is Abe Winter, Winter said, accepting Valerie's phone from her outstretched hand. Where are you presently? I'm in the Central Security Operations Room, Garrett said. Good, I was hoping you'd know to go there, Winter said. You should see two computer terminals in the middle of the room. They have touchscreen interfaces. I'm sitting at one. Press the menu icon, then select lobby. It should give you a digital floor plan view of the lobby atrium and front of the building. Done. Now what? You should see all the doors on the front elevation. They should be displayed in red and annotated as locked. They are. Using the touch screen, you can select any or all doors and manually release the magnetic locks. But here's the kicker. Charlie already has control. He'll see what you're doing and undo any actions you take, 
we'll have one split-second chance at this. Won't he just block me? Unless he's completely reprogrammed the software and firmware, he can't prevent you from issuing a manual command. The signal will disengage the mag lock, but he'll lock it again milliseconds later. We'll have to coordinate and execute perfectly, but we have a shot. Understood, Garrett said. I'll be standing by. Let me know when you're in position and ready. She stared at Cooley, the phone between them, and raised her eyebrows. The SWAT commander shook his head, apparently disgusted by what he was about to authorize, then gave his assent. They briefed quickly. She helped Winter don a tactical vest, and then the 11-person team headed up the flowing tidal stairs leading to the front entrance. With the massive police presence behind them, crossing the expansive, empty approach felt eerily disquieting, like crossing no man's land between two entrenched armies. As Valerie hustled up the steps, she pulled her Glock from her hip holster, wishing it was an M4 assault rifle. A few strides later, she and Winter fell in beside Land as he stopped in a crouch by the main entrance. They were flanked by an eight-man team of SWAT assaulters that split into foursomes, squatting on either side of the double glass doors, their rifles at the ready. Valerie scanned the front facade, which, according to Major Cooley, was constructed entirely of two-inch-thick ballistic glass. Her gaze refocused inside, where a crowd of sweaty, flushed, and terrified civilians were milling about, some shouting, some sobbing, some looking shell-shocked and crying, their voices almost entirely muted by the glass. Three other sets of double doors, just like the set they crouched beside, provided alternate egress points. But these doors were locked as well. A number of the civilian hostages were rhythmically pounding on the inside of the glass, lending a dull, reverberating heartbeat to the terror and misery inside. Something abruptly smacked the glass directly opposite Valerie, giving her a start. A woman collapsed to her knees, her sweaty palms and forehead sliding down the glass. Blood from a gash above the woman's left eyebrow smeared across the glass in an arc as she shouted in incomprehensible desperation at Valerie. And that's when Valerie noticed something different about the lobby from her last visit. How insanely brightly lit it was today. Dear God, Winter murmured behind her. They're all drenched in sweat. It looks like Charlie's repositioned the rooftop mirrors to reflect the maximum amount of sunlight into the atrium. It must feel like the Amazon rainforest in there. I can't imagine how much longer they'll last. A kitted up operator passed her and land radios. These bricks are programmed to our tactical channel, TAC-2. Command is on TAC-1. But stay on with us, he said. Valerie clipped the radio to her belt on her left hip, just behind her extra magazine holder. Then, as she pressed a wired earpiece into her left ear, the operator spoke again. You will fall in behind, he said, especially with the damn civilian you insist on bringing along. We're going two left, two right, and two up the middle. You two follow at the rear, up the middle, with the scientist behind you. He's your responsibility. Once you're in, our other two will secure the door, he said, and gestured to two stubby battering rams, which Valerie surmised would be used to block the doors open. They'll facilitate the evacuation behind us, and then set up security at the door. Is that clear? Clear, Valerie said. But the second we open the doors, the hostages will rush the exit. How do we get in without being trampled? The SWAT officer pursed his lips. You're right, he said. The first four in need to form a wedge, with me in the lead, and we'll push through with you in our wake. Once at the back of the crowd, we then do our clearing procedures. But scan, scan, scan for threats, people. We don't know what we're walking into here. There could be ram shooters in the crowd. Be ready for anything. Check, Land said. Valerie gave a curt nod, but she didn't think there were any shooters in this crowd. This situation was entirely Charlie's handiwork, a ruse to get her and Abe Winter here. But why? The SWAT team leader looked at the doors, then back at Valerie and Land. Make the call to your guy inside. Valerie dialed Garrett, and he answered on the first ring. We're in position, she said. But one more thing, we'd prefer not to be trampled. Any ideas on how to distract the crowd and buy us a few seconds? I could blast music on the atrium speakers, Garrett suggested. Do it, she said, and relayed the plan to the team. 
She looked at the men around her, who all nodded and braced themselves, gripping their weapons. She fished out her AirPod earbud, put it in her right ear, and dropped her iPhone into her pocket. Still hear me? Yes. I'll try to direct you where to go once you're inside. She looked at Winter, who looked stronger than ever, his face set, steady arms at his side. She scanned above them and spied multiple cameras along the overhang above the doors. Can you see us on the security cameras? That's a negative. Charlie has control of the cameras, but I'm working on that. Stay behind me, she said to Winter, and stay close. He nodded. Here comes the music, Marx, Garrett said in her ear. An eardrum-pounding burst of heavy metal music erupted inside the lobby atrium. Valerie watched the crowd scatter inside, most of them covering their ears with their hands. Remember, Winter called from behind her. We only have a fraction of a second. I'm the only one on comms at the control room. I'll tap you on the shoulder when the lock's released, Valerie said to the lead breacher. Pull the handle the instant I do. Check, the operator said. Valerie took Winter's hand and placed it on her left shoulder. Constant contact, she shouted, craning her neck to look back at him. Understand? Got it, he yelled back. Garrett, we're ready, she said. Stand by for door locks on my mark, Garrett said. In three, two, one, mark. To compensate for a response latency, Valerie tapped the breacher's shoulder a split second before hearing Garrett's mark. She thought she heard the magnetic locks disengage with a metallic click, and got her confirmation a moment later when the breacher pulled the right-hand door open. I can't believe it worked, she heard Winter say behind her, and she thought the same thing as they surged forward. The SWAT shooters moved in perfect synchronicity, the first four pushing forward in a modified V, a wedge parting the crowd of sweaty, confused hostages. Another four followed, with Land ducking in behind them. Valerie and Winter went last, falling in behind Land, moving in stride behind the shield of SWAT assaulters, across the threshold, and into the lobby. Chapter 5 Sixth Medical Group Hospital, MacDill Air Force Base, Tampa, Florida, March 22nd, 1515 EDT. It's my job to take your vitals, Mr. Kemper. Would you please just let me do my job? The nurse glared at him, cheeks flushed, one hand on her hip and the other on the machine that would take his pulse and blood pressure if only he would let her. And I told you I'm fine. I just want to rest, but you keep waking my ass up with that damn machine to check if I'm still alive. Well, I'm alive. See? Kemper said, waving childishly at her. My ticker is beating, my blood pressure is just dandy. Now please go so I can get some sleep. Your doctor wants vitals every four hours, she said, but her voice had lost all its fight. He's not my doctor, Kemper said for what seemed the hundredth time. My doctor is, right, right, I know, the nurse said, giving up and tossing her stethoscope onto the machine. Your doctor is the lumberjack with the fake name who drops by and pisses the real doctors off. Thank God you're leaving today. With that, she rolled the machine out, mumbling obscenities under her breath. Thirty seconds later, his hospital room door swung open again, and this time in strolled the lumberjack. Today, Commander Dan Munn looked nothing like an esteemed Navy doctor who raided silver oak leaves on his collar. Munn's unmarked BDU pants, untucked gray Columbia shirt, and oakly desert boots screamed, Don't fuck with me. I've earned the right to look like this. The two-week beard growth he sported was the exclamation point. Munn was a former enlisted SEAL who, instead of retiring and taking a detour into medical school, followed by a tough surgery residency, and finally an even tougher trauma fellowship. And now here he was, back with the teams, still serving the Brotherhood, but in a distinctly different role. Sup, bro? Munn said, hands in his pockets. Shouldn't you be in North Carolina with Kathy, visiting her family before you deploy? Kemper asked. You're going down range in a few weeks, right? Yeah, but she's probably glad to have a couple days away from me. Munn said, which they both knew wasn't true. 
It's good for her to have some private time with her folks. Plus, I wanted to stick around until you discharge. Someone's got to make sure you head home and not straight to the bars. Nothing to worry about. I rarely hit the party scene like I did back in the day. It was true. Being a member of a Tier 1 unit nowadays meant keeping it low-key. When he partied, he partied with his unit, and when he really wanted to cut loose, he'd do it at a friend's house rather than in public. It was better for everyone that way, except for maybe the lucky wife enlisted as the evening's designated driver. So when am I out of here? He asked Mun. Admin is working on your discharge paperwork as we speak. An hour, two at the most. An hour, huh? Guess that means you're my ride? No, nah, Thiel insisted that he and the boys had that honor. Mun glanced at his oversized Sunto wristwatch. I'm supposed to meet the gang in the lobby in 15. Cool, Kemper said, and looked out the window at Hillsborough Bay and the silver-spired downtown Tampa skyline. So what happens next? Rehab and a desk job? Munn placed a hand on his shoulder, reading his mind. Dr. Platts, the spine guy, thinks you'll have full recovery. My vertebra was cracked in half, Dan. Yes, but with the bone fragment back in place, your spine will heal. Now that we have the inflammation under control, you should be feeling a hell of a lot better. Left leg feeling normal? Almost, he said. Still feels kind of heavy. That should go away completely in a few days. Kemper eyed him with suspicion. Okay, two weeks, tops, Munn said. The bone fragment was pressing on the nerve, and now the nerve needs time to calm down. Plus, you had a ton of pressure in a spinal cavity from the swelling and blood and shit. Platts assured me he saw no damage to the nerve. A little physical therapy after the bone mends, and you'll be good to go. Hell, I got twenty bucks wager that you'll be operational before spas. That perked Kemper up. Wager with who? Gabe. Kemper shook his head. Dumb kid. When's he going to learn that experience trumps youth every time? And that you never make a wager with a doctor who has confidential medical knowledge of both patients? Munn quipped. After he'd stopped laughing, Kemper asked, So what's the verdict on spaz? Metal plates to rebuild the femur and a vein graft to bypass his superficial femoral artery. He has a tough road ahead of him, anywhere from a three- to six-month recovery. You do realize when you collect the twenty bucks on that wager the drinks are on you. I wouldn't have it any other way, Munn said. Kemper looked down at his legs. The muscles in his thighs already looked flabby. Was that even possible? He hadn't been in the hospital that long. You okay, Jack? Munn asked, his tone turning serious. Kemper forced a smile. Yeah, I'm good. Just don't bounce like I used to. True for us all, Munn said with a chuckle and a slap on the shoulder. The hospital room door flew open. The sign says, don't fucking disturb, Kemper barked without waiting to see who it was. Didn't think that applied to me, a baritone voice answered. Kemper opened his mouth to assure this jackass that it applied to Air Force docks most of all. But then the tall figure stepped past Mun into his field of view. With his neatly trimmed gray hair, pressed suit coat, and open collar dress shirt, Captain Kelso Jarvis bore little resemblance to the rugged, bearded mountain man look of current operators. As if sensing the disparity, or remembering it, he shrugged off his suit coat, draped it over the back of a nearby chair, and began rolling up his sleeves. Snuck up on a Tier 1 operator. Not many men can say that. Men who are still breathing, that is, Jarvis said. Doesn't count when the man doing the sneaking happens to be a former Tier 1 SEAL commander, sir, said Munn, extending his hand to the man who is arguably the most legendary SEAL in the U.S. military's secret Tier 1 umbrella. Kemper noticed the cords of muscle rippling across the former CSO's right forearm as he shook Munn's hand. Clearly Jarvis still had it. His level of fitness cut at least a decade off his fifty years of age. Once a seal, always a seal, said Jarvis. Been a while, Dan. Good to see you. Likewise, sir, said Munn. I assume you came by to rib Kemper? Absolutely, Jarvis turned toward Kemper. So, how is our guy, Doc? Munn glanced between them. Well, 
He's doing everything in his power to win the title of most belligerent SOB on the ward, but other than that, he's on the mend. That's a relief. I'd hate to think that same belligerent SOB who made my command tour miserable had gone soft in his old age. With a smile, Jarvis added, It's good to see you, Jack. You too, sir, Kemper said, extending his right hand to his former boss. Jarvis gripped his palm and then clasped his left hand against Kemper's forearm. You can cut the sir shit, never called me that in Bosnia or Iraq, so why the hell start now? Despite the divergent paths they'd taken since Jarvis's retirement, the man would always be skipper to Kemper. If Jarvis wouldn't let him say sir, then he'd have to deal with the other. In that case, what brings you to Tampa, skipper? I was in the neighborhood visiting SOCOM and thought I'd drop by and see my old LCPO. A little bird told me you'd had an accident. Minor setback, Kemper corrected, borrowing Jarvis's favorite line, the one he'd made legendary when making sit-reps to the brass. While Jarvis laughed, Kemper wondered what a retired SEAL commander working in the civilian sector had going on at SOCOM. Anyone who knew Jarvis never believed he would stay out of the game for long. What's new with you? Kemper asked. How's civilian life treating you? Relax, senior. This is just a social call, nothing else, Jarvis said. Then, screwing up his face, he added, Man, yes, that's right. I'm aware that you're still a fucking senior chief. Not going to command a desk just to make master chief, Kemper said with a shrug. Jarvis understood. Rather than putting on a star and going soft pushing papers at the Pentagon, Jarvis had retired and moved on. Mind if I sit for a few minutes and shoot the shit? Swap a few lies? Jarvis pulled up an empty chair next to Kemper's hospital bed. Be my guest, Kemper said, straightening. The movement set a stinger down his back, nothing like the pain he'd experienced on the Darya Yanur, but sharp enough that he fought the urge to grimace. No matter the situation, he refused to show weakness in front of Kelso Jarvis. Munn shuffled backward toward the door. Checking his watch, he said, I think I'll go intercept the ass clowns, er, I mean, highly trained elite tactical operators gathering in the lobby. Give you guys a few minutes to catch up before they crash your party. Jarvis waved a hand. No need to rush off, Dan, he said. I swear, this is just a social call. Munn laughed. You've always had a lousy poker face, Skipper, he said, heading out the door. After the door shut behind him, Jarvis casually propped an ankle up on his knee and smiled at Kemper with his slate-gray eyes. Doc's gone, Jack. How are you, really? I'm fine. Really? Sore as hell, but the spine guy says after the bone heals, I'll be a hundred percent fully operational. Requals? Now I should be back online before that much time elapses. Good. Going through requals is a pain in the ass. Jarvis said, nodding. How much time you got left? Time? Kemper asked, confused. Yeah, time, said Jarvis, knocking the edge off his words with his trademark Jack Nicholson chuckle. What, you planning to stay in forever? Even you have a shelf life, Jack. There it was again, shelf life. Hadn't really thought about it, he lied. I got my twenty in, so I suppose I could put in papers any time, but I still got a few good years left. I'm sure, Jarvis said. When the time comes, I might have a place for you. He uncrossed his legs, leaned forward, and propped his elbows on his knees. Does Kate know you're here? Kemper hated when Jarvis did that, opened Pandora's box with one hand, and while you were gawking at it, tossed you a live grenade with the other. His current teammates knew better than to float his ex-wife's name or mention his son, now sixteen, but by rank or history, Jarvis obviously felt he'd earned the privilege. We haven't talked in a long time, he said, hoping to leave it at that. I'm sorry to hear that. She was good for you. Tough girl, Kate. Funny, too. I always liked her, Jarvis continued, unbidden. I knew you were divorced, but I'd heard you were dating her again. Whatever the hell that means for two people who shared a life and had a son together. We were, Kemper said, silently wishing to end the conversation. That changed after the thing in Afghanistan a couple of years back. She wanted me to get out after that. 
Something about straws and camels' backs. Jarvis nodded, a frown tightening his face. Gotcha, he said. How's Jacob? Better off without me. He sighed. Honestly, Skipper, I have no idea. Like I said, we don't really talk. Jarvis simply nodded. Every operator knew the toll the job took on families. Jarvis lived alone, or used to back in the day, so he was intimate with the sacrifice. And the regret. The door burst open and Munn returned with six rowdy mountain men in tow. Kemper's brothers in arms. His family. Kind of nursing this shit, ain't you? Thiel said and high-fived him. The slap ignited a stab of pain in his back. This time it stayed concentrated at the surgery site rather than radiating down his spine. Anything for a med chit to get out of PT, huh, senior? Teased Pablo, with a scratch of the ridiculously thin beard that painted his chin. Ain't you heard, man? The only easy workout was yesterday. I could whip your ass in a swim right now, Kemper fired back, goading the much younger three-time Iron Man competitor. But why bother when I could just whip your ass? Jarvis laughed at the dig and the guys turned to stare at him en masse, as if they'd just noticed him for the first time. This your lawyer, senior? Roush asked. No, this is Captain Kelso Jarvis, he said, and reveled in the gaping jaws all around, except for Thiel, who knew the skipper and just shook his head with pity at the others. A honor to meet you, sir, Roush said, regaining his composure and reaching out a hand. Only a SEAL would breach the protocol of waiting for a senior officer to extend his hand first, and only a blooded SEAL like Jarvis would expect it. Honor's mine, Jarvis said, rising. Pleasure to meet the poor assholes charged with following the senior chief into battle. God bless you guys. After shaking hands all around, Jarvis abruptly said, Well, fellas, I should probably get going. Are you sure, Skipper? Kemper said. After I check out of this dump, we're going to grab some beers. You're welcome to join us. I appreciate the offer, but it's time I go pretend I have a job, he said, donning his suit jacket and making for the door. Left a number for you, Jack. Call me if you need anything. And for Christ's sake, keep me apprised of how you're doing, okay? Will do, Skipper, he said, glancing at the business card Jarvis had left on the tray by his hospital bed. Jarvis paused at the threshold just long enough to make eye contact with Kemper before disappearing. He didn't say anything because his eyes said it all. Don't forget about my offer. Kemper nodded deferentially and then shifted his attention back to the guys. Holy shit, fellas! Was that really THE Captain Jarvis? Roush blurted out once the doorway was clear. Yeah, nice work, dipshit. Gabe said, leering at Roush. Is that your lawyer? Smooth, dude. Fucking smooth. Gator elbowed Gabe. What a dumbass. Hilo chimed in. The others piled on, slamming Roush until his cheeks were crimson. All right, all right. Got a brother some slack, Kemper said. What time are you out of here, boss? Thiel asked. I got a tea time, you know. In that case, let's go, he said and swung his legs out of bed. He winced, unable to mask the spear of pain from the twisting movement. Hold on there, Munn said with a laugh. At least let the nurse get your friggin' IV out, bro, I'll go get her, he said and disappeared out the door. You sure you're okay? asked Thiel. Good as new. Thanks to Munn and that quack there, Kemper said, gesturing to Roush. If it wasn't for you, Spaz and I might not have made it. You're the real deal, Roush. Bravo fucking Zulu, dude. Roush shrugged and quickly shook Kemper's outstretched hand, clearly uncomfortable with such a healthy dose of praise from his team leader in front of the group. Now, let's go grab a beer, Kemper said and rolled his arm so the IV was in Roush's face. Pull this fucking needle out, Doc. While Roush removed the IV, Pablo fetched a wheelchair from the adjacent room. Two minutes later, Kemper was strapped into some poor bastard's missing wheelchair with the rest of the gang running at his side, hooting and hollering. He tilted his head back to look at Roush, who was propelling him down the corridor at ludicrous speed. Driver, we need to make a detour by room 178 on our way out of this dump. Sure thing, senior, Roush said. What's the mission? 
Operation Spaz Attack. He turned to Pablo, who was jogging next to him. Did you bring the two items I requested? You mean these? Pablo said, holding up a Spider-Man doll in one hand and a rubber shark in the other. Kemper flashed Pablo his broadest Cheshire cat grin and then said to the group, I heard from one of the nurses that Spaz was lonely. The least we can do is drop off his two best friends to keep him company while we go party. Chapter 5 Wreckage of the MI-17 helicopter, 55 kilometers southeast of Hadita, 8 kilometers west of Al-Wadi Tharthar, Iraq, 0645 local time. Dempsey opened his eyes. A beam of light streamed in through a porthole window overhead. He was on his back, lying on something hard and uncomfortable. He heard someone groan and then gurgle. A surge of adrenaline burned the cobwebs from his mind, and he immediately understood where he was and what had just happened. He didn't think he'd lost consciousness when they crashed, but maybe. Maybe. His hands flew over his chest, abdomen, flanks, and thighs, checking for wetness, deformity, or pain. Feeling none of these things, he wiped the back of his hand across his forehead and saw a smear of blood on his sleeve and hand. He probed and found the wound. It felt small and shallow, a laceration a couple of inches above his left ear. Scalp wounds were bleeders and looked ugly, but so long as his skull was intact, he'd be fine. He got himself up into a crouch. What remained of the mangled Russian helo was rolled on its side. He was squatting on the starboard wall, now the floor, directly below the port side slider door. He stood and a jolt of pain immediately flared across his lower back and down his left leg. He repositioned his left boot, straightened his hips, and the angry nerve settled down. Just an old back injury, aggravated by the crash. Given the circumstances, he'd take it. He was fine. Absolutely fucking fine. He'd survived a helicopter crash virtually unscathed. Unfortunately, the same could not be said for his travel companions. The prisoner still lashed to the starboard bench seat, moaned. The man's left forearm had a new and extra joint. His hand dangled, twisted at an impossible angle where the bones had snapped on impact against the seat rail. Dempsey wondered if the man had a concussion or internal injuries, or both. Time would tell. He stepped around the prisoner and worked his way aft. In the back of the cargo compartment, he found Chunk kneeling beside the younger seal, pulling a dry dressing from his blowout kit. You guys alive back here? Dempsey said, putting a hand on the lieutenant's shoulder and hunching over for a better view of the injured seal. I'm fine, but Patch here got himself a new knee, Chunk said, pressing the dressing against the bone protruding through a tear in the seal's BDUs. Son of a bitch, Chunk! Patch hissed at his platoon leader. Ah, the bones ain't going back together, bro. Thanks again for inviting us to your party, Chunk grumbled over his shoulder at Dempsey. You're welcome next time I'll rent a limo. Turning toward the cockpit, he added, I'm going to go check on the pilot, see how he's doing. The pilot is kind of fucked, called a strained voice from the front of the helo. Dempsey worked his way forward, stepping over the dazed terrorist once again. He stuck his head into the horizontal doorway and looked up. The pilot hung suspended, still in his seat, with the control panel collapsed against his lap, trapping his legs. The Army aviator gripped a Sopmod M4 in his right hand and was straining to see out the shattered windshield. You okay? Dempsey asked. The pilot looked down at him, face tense with worry. I don't know he said. I don't feel like anything's broken, but I'm hard pinned. My legs are numb. Can you move your toes? Yeah, the pilot said, nodding. I think so. That's good. Any pain? No, not really. Dempsey put a hand on the man's cheek. His skin was warm and flushed. That was a good sign. Had the pilot been cold and clammy, it would have been an indicator of shock. On the flip side, even the most horrific injuries were virtually painless in the heat of battle. He'd seen soldiers with their legs blown off look surprised and confused when they couldn't stand up. 